Hello to the 24 people who will watch this video and the 12 people who will finish it. If you aren't one of those 24 people, then you're a bot. And if you think you aren't a bot, then solve this CAPTCHA and prove it. To everyone who remains, thank you and let's proceed. Uh, it's like, the thing is, what's so funny about this is that this type of a thing would never happen in a TV show because the audience would never believe that a normal person could be this stupid. So, like, the willing suspension of disbelief would be impossible to achieve with a character like Amber Heard. So, it, they, this would actually not be in a TV show because it wouldn't be compelling because people would be like, this is fake. There's no way somebody would be like this. But actually, oh... Remember when Jurassic Park 3 was released and everyone collectively laughed at it because of how fascinatingly stupid it was? And no, I'm not just referring to the talking raptor dream sequence, I'm referring to all of it. Yes, the velociraptor turning into a Muppet was pretty funny, but we can't exclude the other equally worthy elements that lump together into the culmination that was this movie. Beautiful. Oh my god. And now he'll pull up, but he wouldn't for his friend. <laughs> Shit, I'm in danger! <laughs> All in all, it did a pretty good job of becoming the laughing stock of the Jurassic Park franchise, and it remained that for a very long time. Then 2015 rolled around, and we were given the long-awaited follow-up, Jurassic World, and everyone said, oh my god, dinosaurs, we haven't seen those in a while, and it instantly became an insanely large success, despite the fact that it was even stupider than Jurassic Park 3. The franchise had basically just turned into the Fast and the Furious at this point, and we got to be treated to big bigger and better dinosaurs than ever before, Chris Pratt playing himself, and raptors getting blown up by RPGs. Regardless of such, it was heralded as the triumphant return of Jurassic Park, and at a time where everyone was in a state of nostalgic limbo between this and Star Wars, people ate it right up. That's not to say there weren't criticisms, and while the critics were far and few between and the majority of people still liked the movie, there was at least one bit that quite a few moviegoers unanimously agreed upon. That being how laughably stupid of an idea it was to think that dinosaurs could be used as viable military assets. Not only as combatants, but replacements to drones and other surveillance technology. This was something that the movie wanted us to take very seriously as a potential direction of this series, where genetic technology would instead be used for furthering military applications rather than Oh my god, that one makes a cooler noise than the last one. Harking back to those beautiful pieces of concept art from the scrapped Jurassic Park 4 project. However, Colin Trevorrow really thought it was a good idea, because despite everyone laughing at him for it, he doubled down in Fallen Kingdom, justifying it by saying that animals had been used for war in the past. Meanwhile, the franchise was devolving into even further insanity. While Jurassic World was just an explosion-filled retelling of the first movie, Fallen Kingdom decided to be this weird, mutated version of Lost World that just crumbles apart after the halfway point. We were introduced to discount John Hammond, because this was before Hollywood would knew they could get away with CGIing a dead actor in. We got an even better new dinosaur that was disjointedly crammed into the final act of the film, and we were left off with the horrifying climax of, oh no, the little clone girl whose reveal came out of goddamn nowhere hit the button and 
let all the dinosaurs out because they're also clones, so she feels bad for them. And now there's like 50, maybe 60 chimeras running around Northern California that are all going to die anyway because they were supposedly bred for a tropical environment. And even if they weren't, we could just recapture them all anyway because they all have tracking systems installed in them as told via our stupid dumbass logic from earlier in the film. So this isn't actually a problem in the absolute slightest. Animal Control would be able to handle this situation by the end of the evening. But I guess not. Dinosaurs are actually everywhere now, and they're taking over the world. And humanity might not be the dominant life force on the planet anymore, because nobody's going to try and do anything about it, apparently. And other people are out there cloning dinosaurs, and... I, I don't know, letting them out, I guess, so we can have this dumbass premise to begin with. Because keep in mind, our little Noah's Ark metaphor didn't actually get that many dinosaurs off of Isla Nublar. The film made a point to say that there were still quite a few left behind, and all the ones they did get were placed onto a small handful of cargo ships before subsequently being stuffed into Grandpa's basement while he was out gluing his hands to Starbucks counters. And that brings us to present day, Jurassic World Dominion, the story of what happens when every single single person on the face of the earth is so goddamn incompetent that they can't recapture a single 30 foot tall kaiju before it begins reproducing. Damn, I don't see it. <laughs> Why you How'd you mean? lose him? How did you lose him? How'd you lose the T-Rex? Yeah, sorry. I was busy firing my trank dart into the civilian vehicles. It's a difficult target, man. It only takes up half the goddamn drive up screen. And now I, the person with the aerial view of the situation, has lost track of the gigantic monster that was just in the sight of my scope. Uh, it just vanished. Tyrannosaurus is going to just full on teleport now, I guess. Sorry, I guess dinosaurs rule the world again, guys. Nothing can be done about it now. I have such a problem with this. Bro, this is not realistic in the slightest. No, no, because guns exist. <laughs> yeah, I'd say, there's this cool invention. I really was created in the early, uh, all of long this, time ago. All of this that's going on is outside of the United States. <laughs> Because if a fucking anything shows up in my backyard, Dude, I'm eating one. I'm gonna it's get happening. it. And then but I'm not worried die. about it. Chicken's a fucking dinosaur. Yeah. So you know what? Fuck you. I'll eat me a pterodactyl. Yeah. Yes, so I these people up. are literally just living in a world where dinosaurs are roaming yeah, again. Yeah. Like it's fucking normal. Please. This is completely unbelievable. No. Like, no, the like world, no, the world should be in a, an apocalypse right no, now. It's, it's, this is completely unbelievable. Just uh, wait. Many of the larger predators were captured. Oh. Well, never mind then. Backtracking on all this already, huh? Well, crap, let's just take a moment to sweep all this promotional material under the rug. Okay, so you recaptured most of the predators, but conveniently missed the Velociraptor, which is arguably more deadly than any of the other ones are. And you just didn't recapture the herbivores. Why? You guys realize these things are still dangerous, right? I know this franchise has wanted us for a very long time to differentiate the evil dinosaurs from the nice dinosaurs, but you know that's not how animals work, right? Most of these things have medieval weaponry built into them, but because it eats grass, it isn't as much of a containment priority, I guess. As the dinosaurs spread across borders, a global black market has risen. What? Spread across borders? The hell is that supposed to mean? There was less than a hundred of them. How are they already spreading to other continents? Unless we're saying that this newly cropped up dino black market is smuggling them through. Dinosaurs have existed in this universe for over 30 years, but apparently people are just now starting to realize that they can sell them. But if that's the explanation we're going with, I still have no idea why they're uncaptured ones in the wild. Unless the joke I made earlier is actually canon, where this black market is propagating these species into the wild for some reason. Because there's no way they're doing it on their own. Like I said, these animals have lived on Sorna and Nublar for over three decades. And the only time they've bothered people off those islands was when some dumbass took them to the mainland. Even the pterodactyls at the end of three had an invisible wall or something when they tried to leave because we never heard from them again. In order to get to the position of being a worldwide threat to humanity, these things actually need our help. And even then, it's undermined by the fact that people own guns. Yeah, remember those? 
that piece of technology that this franchise regularly forgets about. Even if every single person charged with recapturing these stupid things were incompetent, drooling morons, all this would do is ultimately spell out the dinosaurs reaching an even more hastened demise because some redneck with a double barrel would decide that he wanted to see what T-Rex tasted like. So what has the government been doing about this, you may be asking? People are dying, the ecosystem and food chain are being all but destroyed, and people are trying to sell these things things to each other. Suffice to say that the world is in a bit of a pickle at the moment. Well, in a move that shocks absolutely no one, they decided they were going to give full collection rights to a single corporation, Biosyn Genetics, a group of truth-seeking pioneers looking to study their immune systems for unique pharmaceutical properties. <laughs> yeah, man, sure. We're going to take these chimeras and study them for your health. The cure for cancer is in these animals that we made. Trust us, we're a genetics company that has a complete monopoly on their existence now. We're definitely not owned by China and making human dinosaur hybrids off to the side. You can just uh, study the immune system of a fucking bird. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, honestly, can't fault the movie too hard. This does seem like something the government would go with. What are we going to do about the dinosaurs that are threatening the life of our species? Let's transfer all the ownership rights to InGen's competitors. Y yeah, you know, the ones who couldn't make their own dinosaurs because they sucked so much, so they came up with an unironic steal the Krabby Patty secret formula plot in the first movie. I would be concerned of something else if I were you. <laughs> like, unleashing fucking dinosaurs on the world, but yeah, whatever floats yeah, around. Yeah, you would think. You'd think that'd be a slightly bigger deal than these people are treating it as. <laughs> Mm -hmm. How does this stop the black market sales and poaching, you may ask? Well, because it's illegal now. They, they, they can't do it because Biosyn owns them. And you certainly wouldn't want to infringe on copyright law, would you? And of course, since Biosyn has full collection rights, that means they technically own the dinosaurs that are still loose in the wild. Which begs the question of what are the legal specifics of someone trying to defend themselves from one? Are you allowed to shoot a velociraptor that's trying to kill you? Or is that considered a pesky case of illegal poaching like you were talking about earlier? You idiots have had four years to round these things up and you just aren't doing it for some reason. And on top of that, you're making more of them. So these animals that you own are being left to wreak havoc across the world and nobody can do anything about it. This also means that the black market can scoop up as many dinosaurs as they goddamn well please because their populations are being left completely unchecked while China is busy stapling pig heads onto their private collection. You're facilitating more crime by making this regulation that's supposed to prevent crime just like real life. No problems with this movie so far. Also, nice product placement with the random ass Now This logo movie. I love how the implication is that we're watching a video from their website, which is mainly detailing important events from the last few years that the general public would already be aware of. Everything is explicitly described in the past tense, particularly the recapture of the Predators and the acquisition from Biosyn. Also, I, I remember people talking about this this Tim Cook clone. <laughs> yeah, that's the what, Apple CEO. That's what I'm calling him in the script. <laughs> <laughs> Good. I, I don't think they were being particularly subtle with his uh, with his looks here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It isn't even being described as something that's currently happening or about to happen. This is all stuff that has already taken place and is wrapped up in its entirety. A screamingly obvious exposition piece that was just thrown in to set the stage for the audience. Don't get me wrong, I know videos like this exist. It was probably headlined with some cringy clickbait title about Biosyn or some crap. But my god, why? Why would you do it like this? You know, aside from the stupid amount of money you're probably going to get for plastering this logo in front of the movie's opening. You could have achieved the exact same thing with minimal dialogue changes by just having a voiceover from Claire or some crap. Would it be more tropey? Yes. Would it also set the stage for the story with an equal amount of effectiveness while also establishing a tether and reintroduction to one of the characters that's supposedly a protagonist? Yep. Yeah, yeah, it would. 
That's okay though. Story's still relatively set, albeit a little bumpy along the way. And now I know to go and get all my quickly digestible current events coverage from Now This News. How incredibly helpful of you, Jurassic World Dominion. Yeah, this is the opening three minutes of the movie, by the way. We haven't even gotten to its title intro yet. This one's going to be a journey, dear viewer. Oh God, we haven't even started the movie. <laughs> okay, right there. So with that being said, a very deep and humble thank you to everyone who suffered through this movie with me, and a very deep and humble thank you to those watching now. In loving memory of the only good Jurassic Park movie to exist, let's rip this thing apart, shall we? The movie <laughs> is uh, two hours and 26 minutes long. Oh, God damn. <laughs> Well, I heard it doesn't have a lot of dinosaurs. <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, did, this dinosaur movie doesn't have a lot of dinosaurs. No, 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 no. It's uh, hmm. see, the, it's about, it's actually about giant grasshoppers. Wow. <laughs> we immediately see the repercussions of all these new laws in the following scene, where we get reintroduced to Claire and what she's been up to these past few years. Claire has joined Dinosaur PETA and is going about getting as much done as PETA usually does, trying to pull on the heartstrings of look at the cute things that are sad. But just like real life Claire, I guarantee you that Biosyn doesn't give a crap. I mean, sure, they're going to see this and say, hey, those are mine. We need those for pharmaceutical research. And then this place will get instantly shut down, but I can't really speak to the well-being of the dinosaurs after that. They're probably going to be experimented on, given a number of different diseases and poked and prodded by needles for the rest of their short, short lives. Not to mention being implanted with the literal mind control device that Biosyn puts into its assets, but eh, it's, at least it's not being illegally bred anymore, huh? You're doing the right thing, Claire. They're studying the dinosaurs for pharmaceutical properties. Yeah. Yeah. And you can't have one. Yeah. <laughs> However, with that said, there hasn't been a single watch through where this scene hasn't made me almost completely tune out from the sheer amount of irrelevance that it holds. This is something we'll be dissecting as the film progresses, but if you want a little taste of what's to come, Claire's character arc isn't exactly prioritized to say the absolute least. Let's skip this and see what Owen's been up to. So are we doing this thing where like, Owen, by the way, I've come back to you, even though, are we doing that shit again? No, 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 they're skipping that. Man, they didn't have time for that plot line in this movie. Oh, you like that, do you? I do. Oh, yeah. oh my god. <laughs> we see him and a bunch of other people chasing a herd of Parasaurolophus on horseback. Oh yes, that's never been done before. No. Not in the Sierra Nevadas. Yeah, no, no. Being chased on this horseback. Is, this is the first time they've done it with snow, Tana. <laughs> During this time, Owen proceeds to lasso one of them and somehow doesn't instantly bring his horse to the ground the second it makes contact. I'm not sure if you noticed this or not, but the Parasaurolophus is significantly larger than that horse. What's going on, Pratt? What's your plan once the dinosaur decides nah and keeps going? You know, the thing that almost instantly happens as soon as the rope goes around its neck. Remember in Lost World, where taking down a Parasaurolophus was actually difficult and required multiple men to be coordinated in the process even after the thing had been tranked yeah well cool chris pratt got stuck on a tree stump and completely halted one in its tracks oh fuck the, it he's holding the, the dinosaur he's with a, okay. stump and a rope it was a stump it wasn't even like a fully grown <laughs> tree overpowering the dinosaur by Shit. laying on the ground uh, yes uh, he's yeah. overpowering a parasaurolophus which out which is at least four <laughs> times his fucking weight no, no, in the, um, no. in the second, no, <laughs> no, no, uh, that horse is fucked. What the fuck is your plan, that buddy? That horse will fucking die. You're like, not uh, stopping uh, it. Well, oh, Chris no. Pratt just lost uh, an arm. Yeah. No, <laughs> no, that tree limb is not going to hold. Right. Okay. Yeah, look how strong those goddamn legs are. I mean, no, I mean, yeah. like, look at the horse's strong legs. and like, oh, horse strong. And he couldn't stop it. Okay, yeah. No. Have fun. Have fun dislocating. Yeah. Right. Shoulders. Like. like I don't think, bro. This would kill you. Are you kidding me? You could get dragged. Like you're both. 
Oh look, a handy little tree stump. Yeah. Right. Like Chris this Pratt... thing weighs a ton. Yeah, Chris Pratt doesn't no. have arms anymore. That's is crazy. what happened here. Yeah, honestly. <laughs> One would think that the rope would just break or I don't I don't know, slip out of his hand because this is a significantly more powerful animal than him, but nah. He's able to tie it down and play Dinosaur Whisperer with it. That's not a joke, by the way. That's actually what happens. Dude just holds his hand out at this wild animal that's currently panicking about being trapped, and it starts slowly calming down before becoming a house cat. I mean, he's doing the hand thing. He, of course he, he it's going to calm down. He is doing the hand thing. I know they think they are, their whole thing is herbivore good. An herbivore yeah. would fucking kick yeah. him in the oh face my God. and this stomp him already, to death. This thing has already Herb started attacking him. Herbivore good. Yeah. <laughs> fucking third person this month has been oh. mauled no, in Yellowstone. No, he's doing the thing. That's not how this works. Uh, he's doing the thing. The only reason that worked for the raptors is because he raised them. He's doing the thing. <laughs> he has the gift. Yeah. Oh, it's Dino the, Jesus. It's the shining. <laughs> Dino Jesus. <laughs> I mean, Nothing I mean, we, we that all eats know... grass has ever been aggressive. No, no we're very used to it. Yeah, like the yeah, friendly and moose. lovable hippopotamus. <laughs> yeah, the, yeah, hippos are, are known for being incredibly friendly. Yeah, that's, that's pretty impressive, Owen. You just straight up tamed a cornered wild animal in about 30 seconds. I wonder what would happen if you tried doing that with a buffalo or something. It's such a fucking meme on, in the franchise, him just putting his hand up and they're like, Oh, I, I obey your every command, master. <laughs> there, there, majestic creature. I mean you no harm. We're gonna get you someplace safe. Uh-huh. Sure, man. Provided I'm not even 100% sure what these morons are doing with these dinosaurs, because the film never says, but I fail to see the connection of how anything you could be doing would be beneficial for this thing. You were going after a herd of these Parasaurolophus, and you successfully captured one of them. I yeah, man, the herd animal will be safer now that you're taking it away from its herd to a completely different area where it will have to try and reintegrate with a different herd. Assuming that's even possible, depending on how these things behave with one another. You could just be separating it for good, where it will then proceed to die from the very first predator that encounters it. Either way, the amount of stress it's probably going through right now is undoubtedly astronomical even as you're sitting there being all nice to it which of course has the possibility of adversely affecting its health and putting it at a lower chance of survival for wherever you plan on putting it good job. so yeah no idea what you're doing with these animals Owen but since you're the good guy I guess I don't need to give it any further thought after all you and Claire did adopt poor little orphan Annie over here and have dedicated your lives to hiding her from Biosyn yeah I remember her everyone the person whose fault all of this is? Yeah, well, she's back too, with a brand new personality update. The ever-popular, entitled, bitchy teenager update. Wait, so why the fuck does the government want this clone bitch? Because she, I don't know, because she was <laughs> a clone bitch who was made uh, <laughs> by InGen along with the dinosaurs and... She's unique, so she's I guess. Yeah. Art dinosaur. I, I, <laughs> 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 That's not even like the no. lamest like suggestion. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Nice one, Colin. You made the character that everyone already didn't like that much even more insufferable. For those who may have forgotten her, Maisie was the little girl living under the roof of Grandpa Almond Milk Cromwell. Around the end point of the movie, Colin Trevorrow remembered that she existed and that he had a super cool idea with her. However, he didn't want to go back and write anything new in the draft that he was on, so instead he hastily scribbled in a scene where the bad guy shows up and says, Hey, just so you guys know, that girl there is a clone. She died a while back and... Grandpa Cromwell was sad about it, so he cloned her. Okay, my exposition part is done now. Oh, God! What relevance does this hold to anything that's currently going on? Well, nothing, but now you know. Of course, this is what led to her deciding to doom humanity because she had clone empathy for the monsters in the room beside her. Blast damaged the ventilation system. We did everything we could. Except open the vent. 
<laughs> like, all vents can be opened manually. <laughs> like, all of them. Yeah, yeah. So fucking stupid. <laughs> you better let them all out there. There's nothing we can do. We can't ventilate a space. Clear. You press that button, there is no going back. What are you talking about? They all have trackers. Dude, just open the vent! <laughs> Are you gonna let them all die? They're gonna let them all die. Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good idea. Could've just opened the vent. Could've just opened the vent. Who did it? Oh, she did oh it. Oh my god. Cause she's a clone too. How could you? They're alive. Uh -huh. Chimeras are real yeah, there, people. There it is. They're alive like me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they're chimeras what, like me. They up. deserve human rights. <laughs> Shut the door and then you shoot her in the head. <laughs> yeah, you know, you, you stop the opening door, you close it. Yeah, yeah, and you fucking... <laughs> Bad clone. Bad clone. They didn't clone you smart enough, I see. You're back in your cell with the others. Oh. Now you get to go play with the dinosaurs in the gas chamber. <laughs> <laughs> Doses. Where were you keeping that? Yeah, don't worry about it. <laughs> Welcome to Jurassic World. Jurassic World, nigga, the 20! <laughs> Welcome to Jurassic World. Welcome to Jurassic, shut the fuck up! What do you mean? Very heartwarming indeed. And as you can imagine, everyone took it incredibly seriously. So you may be asking, what's Maisie been up to since she created unprecedented imbalance in the world's ecosystem and undoubtedly caused the deaths of countless people and the possible extinction of other species that couldn't compete with the genetically engineered super killers? Well, like I said, she's been living with Uncle Chris and Auntie Bryce. Being a clone from InGen, she's technically property of Biosyn now, so the two of them have isolated with her in order to try and protect her from being captured by them, essentially assuring that they themselves are fugitives in possession of Biosyn's genetic asset. Needless to say, Maisie is consistently grateful that these two strangers that have absolutely no reason to help her have sacrificed their entire lives in order to guarantee her safety. I said I didn't go past the bridge. Hey, what's up? You can't keep me here, you're not my mother. All right. That's 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 what Colin would have done had he realized that Fallen Kingdom's ending didn't really endear audiences to her like he had hoped. No, no, no. We get annoying brat Maisie. Annoying brat Maisie who gets pissy at her surrogate parents if they so much as lightly broach the topic of her sneaking out and going into town. Listen, kiddo, we should probably talk about you going into town. You're not trapped here. We just don't trust people. No, you just don't trust me. Correct. You're an abomination. <laughs> and then you expect me to trust you. Why don't you just tell her that there are people who are after her? Well, she knows that. That's a thing. Well, then she's a fucking idiot. Yes. <laughs> I'll give you some points for realism movie, but goddamn. If your goal was to get people to like her, in what reality did you think it was a good idea to write her like this? I, I think I think I got the picture that they're trying to protect her like five minutes ago. You don't have to like say it again. We have to protect her, yeah. but we can't keep her inside. Uh -huh. She's gonna <laughs> revolt. Oh, that's a bad guy! Oh my god, his hair is greased. <laughs> First oh, that, oh, uh, that guy's a bad guy. Because he lost no, his orb. How did you tell? How did you know? No. That's exactly because what they, I said, Isaiah, they, when I watched it. Yeah, they focused in on him and he didn't look happy. He's a bad guy. <laughs> oh, crap. I haven't even talked about this dumbass yet. So while Owen was breaking the laws of physics with his new dinosaur buddy, we're shown a brief shot of nameless bad guy one and his crew of evil henchmen watching the situation unfold. Turns out this guy is on the bios and payroll, sort of, having been sent out to look for Blue the Velociraptor. Keep in mind, it has been four years since the events of Fallen Kingdom. In that movie, Blue was specifically noted to be a high value target because of the fact that she's the last velociraptor in existence or something like that. Which brings us full circle back to that nifty little line at the beginning of the movie. Many of the larger predators were captured. Many of the larger predators have been captured. But 
We're just now getting around to recapturing the one thing that was nearly the entire reason for the rescue trip in Fallen Kingdom. Four years later. Oh yeah, there was a Velociraptor, huh? Either that or this guy's just really really terrible at his job and he's just now finding the thing all of the other capture teams have been reassigned to other duties but dog the bounty hunter is still out in the field dusting the ground for raptor prints so bravo nameless bad guy biosyn's probably forgotten about you at this point but thankfully you just struck the dumbass lottery because blue has apparently set her territory up right next to where claire and owen are so that's Jake the one that they call having... blue yes yep. Yep, yep. Yeah, yeah. Oh, how'd you guess, Red? Right? That's the that's well, the nice Velociraptor. <laughs> well, it has some bluish garbage on back. <laughs> yeah, the nice raptor, you know, the one that like. Uh, oh yes, of course, betrayed, the one that tried to fucking kill character. him in the first movie. Yeah, yeah. no, 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 no. no. Just, it was uh, that was okay. He was, uh, she was. Yeah, that was just a misunderstanding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. So, that one. Yeah, it's all yes, water. She under was the on her period. Now. It makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Holy crap! That's that's coincidental say the least specifically because this seems to be a new thing one could argue that blue just naturally stayed close to owen considering she would still view him as her alpha however if that's the case you'd think our happy little family would have noticed her a little sooner but they don't seem to realize that she's there at one point Maisie hears blue cawing in the distance but then doesn't say anything about it for some reason and a little while after owen hears her himself but then doesn't react to it in any fashion whatsoever, almost indicating that they are aware that she's around, because otherwise, why the hell aren't you mentioning to one another that you heard a velociraptor nearby? And holy crap, why are you going out and sitting in the darkness when you're hearing raptor calls during the day? It is widely and unanimously agreed upon that these things are by far the most dangerous and lethal predators in Gen made. This is something that you yourself are aware of, Owen, because you spent the entire first world movie talking about how dangerous they are and how they could just instantly kill you if you made one wrong move. Ah, but Pendulum, you may be saying. Don't you recall? Fallen Kingdom retconned that and made it so Blue had empathy installed with the latest in-gen patch. She is Raptor 2.0 who is nice to people when they're sad. Alright, you need, maybe you need to pick a fucking lane here. Are the meat eaters bad guys or not? No, these ones are nice. So you're telling <laughs> yeah. me they're racist against T-Rexes. <laughs> no, the T-Rex is good sometimes too. <laughs> I remember when these things were so menacing and 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 you know no scary. dan it's and, cute. You know, it's like it's a cute. superhero <laughs> character yeah look look it's got These a baby oh, it's stuff. got the baby what? it has it's a baby oh, yeah. it has a little baby yeah. by the way i know I, I i know how i know how blue gave birth to the baby and apparently it's engine stupid. didn't learn their fucking lesson <laughs> last time Stupid raptor, you fell. Right, so let's run with that real quick. This will be fun, because it's going to overlap into my other point. I'll, I'll even ignore that this line exists. You won't hurt us, right? Oh, you damn right you will. But it has been four years since Blue was just set loose in the wild, and has had, to our knowledge, absolutely no contact with Owen whatsoever. She's had to adapt to an unfamiliar environment in which she doesn't know what's safe to target as prey, and what is something that could actually injure her. We can safely assume she has a pretty good idea now, but now things are a bit different. Now she has an infant to care for, meaning that food is now a lot more important to acquire. I'm a god, it's a baby. Oh. So... <laughs> so is Chris, is Brett a father? <laughs> I... <laughs> 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 and don't even pretend I'm the only one who thought of it. So, yeah, four years of experience have shown us that the long-eared fluffy thing isn't poisonous to touch. But you know what has proven to be a much, much easier target in the past and also provides a lot more meat? Oh, yeah. The squishy monkey things. 
So if we're looking at this from the standpoint of how animals actually behave, especially ones that are considered significantly more intelligent, there is no way in hell that Blue has not tried to kill someone over the course of the last four years. Unless she is also aware that she's hiding from the government, she would have absolutely no reason not to do this, especially when she has a baby to feed. And I don't think that I really need to say this, but the second she starts trying to attack people, she's going to get captured. Captured. Although, goddamn, for all I know, she is aware of it and has developed intricate strategies for avoiding capture. After all, this is the same velociraptor that somehow recognized the smell of gas and knew she had to jump away from an explosion that was about to happen. Not only did they install empathy with that patch, but they also added a couple grades of introductory chemistry. Ew, gas. <laughs> what? <laughs> what? <laughs> Oh. <laughs> oh god. Cool That's... raptors don't look at explosions. Wow. Yeah, cool raptors don't look at explosions. I'm thoroughly impressed. Hyper intelligent. <laughs> yeah. You mean he was like, see that thing where he paused and was like, he's like, there's gonna be an explosion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> three <laughs> seconds. Yeah, three seconds. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but to bring myself back to the point, when Blue finally does show herself to them, they act surprised at her presence as if this is the first time they've seen her. Naturally, Maisie's first reaction to seeing a baby velociraptor is to start walking up to it, as if we didn't have an entire movie dedicated to explaining why that's a terrible, terrible idea. Following up with an even more brilliant plan, she then decides to hold her hand out to it. <laughs> yeah, it, uh, hmm. it like... Look, like, maybe it wants to be my salty. friend. <laughs> it's a baby raptor. I'm gonna give you it like this piece of bread. Crackers? You're a clone just like me. <laughs> <laughs> baby velociraptor, I'm gonna walk towards it. Yeah. <laughs> Do you know if you feed a bear, it won't go, oh, you're gonna feed me more? It goes, cool, I can eat you too. <laughs> you look just like Blue. It's a bird brain. <laughs> it's been four years! I just think, nom, nom, <laughs> nom. Don't worry, you're a clone <laughs> like me. You won't hurt me. Yeah, clones recognize other clones. Yeah, yeah. It'll love this okay. slice of bread I happen to have outside for no reason. <laughs> In what I can confidently note is one of the most unrealistic parts of this movie, Maisie is not instantly killed by Blue leaping out of the tree line at her. Instead, she kind of just stalks out and growls at her a bit before Owen comes out and does the hand thing that always saves the day. Oh, man, how did he come thing. out there? He just teleported. <laughs> yeah. All of a sudden, he was just there. Uh, I, will now, I will now use my dinosaur powers. <laughs> I often think about it, how I, I, would ha I would fare in hand-to-hand -hand combat against a Rottweiler. <laughs> what a statement, I'm sorry. <laughs> there's no context or anything, but there, there's uh. one that gets out every once in a while, and so, like, you know, wandering around night, and, like, one, you know, I'm going to take down a Rottweiler, you know. Living in a world like this, I think that that would, uh, that would cr end up crossing these people's mind. Dude, and his dad, and her dad would, dad, tell her, <laughs> don't feed any fucking dinosaurs. <laughs> I, Dude, can you imagine dedicating and sacrificing your entire life to protect this girl? Abomination. And, yeah, yeah. And then you catch her feeding a baby velociraptor outside of your house. They fill you full of stupid in that lab, bitch. <laughs> Damn, they all—they really cloned the fucking stupid in you. <laughs> you got extra stupid. Like, you're literally an intelligence of five. Uh, like, don't do that. They'll come back with more. <laughs> <laughs> and since he's the only character in these movies that ever expresses any flicker of intelligence, upon Blue running off, Owen tells Maisie to go back inside. Because, you know, there's a velociraptor out here. These things are a touch aggressive. But this is new and improved Maisie. And she's not going to do that. No, no, no. Now, she's going to start an argument over it. Well, yes, Owen. I am aware that I'm the entire reason that Blue advanced onto me in the first place because I walked up to her baby and started feeding it like a goddamn moron. I also know the people looking for Blue are the same people that are looking for me. So it actually makes perfect sense that you want me to go inside. However, I want to be out here. So I'm going to stay out here. 
Then I'm going to get unreasonably angry when you snap at me over it before taking my bike out and turning myself into a moving target for the apex predator that we now know is running around in the adjacent woods. That's what I'm going to do, Owen. What are you going to do? You can't keep me here, you're not my mother. Okay, have fun. Yeah, you don't have a mother, yeah. you fucking freak. Yeah. <laughs> Dude, if I, if I, if that was a good woman, what she would do was she would just shut the door. She would throw, go and gather up all that girl's shit, throw it away, make nice dinner for Chris Pratt and be like, she's gone. <laughs> and then like we can have sex dinner, dinner and have like, a real we, baby that yeah, we can have sex as loud as we want tonight <laughs> well owen having narrowly escaped disembowelment himself decided it would be a fantastic idea to chase after blue why is he doing this you may ask her nest has got to be nearby uh yeah i don't know i like for real, man. Like, what exactly are you going to do when you find this nest? You're going to hold your hand out at Blue and try and keep her from killing you again. What are you doing? Yeah, yeah. you're in a bad way. Yeah, it's yeah, been yeah, three it's years. Good. He doesn't yeah. know who you are. You're food. <laughs> oh, you have the clicky thing. Yeah. I hated the clicky thing. Yeah. Chomp. <laughs> and of course, Poacher Guy is watching all this unfold, wherein he radios in that it's time to initiate the plan. And how lucky, they can snatch up Princess Entitlement while they're waiting for Blue Jr. to walk into the trap they have placed for it. Oh, yeah, the red oh. woman's waiting on the she bridge. She rode that bicycle halfway down the bridge, knowing she was there before she stopped. Yeah. <laughs> this this yeah, lady was you, just you, waiting you here that. for like two hours oh, no. for her to ride her <laughs> bike in. It's, it's a consequence of her dinosaur DNA. He throws the yeah. Um, yeah. She's, why are you throwing the bike, bitch? Fuck your bike. That was a good bike. <laughs> yeah, honestly. <laughs> it's a fucking... Oh. Never learned how to ride it. All of this goes off without a hitch. Owen accomplishes absolutely nothing. And after he runs back to get Claire, they're confronted by an angry blue. But don't worry, because Owen comes out and does the hand thing again. God damn, dude. That is one powerful tool you have there. How many raptor attacks are we up to now that you've just full on diffused by doing this? Are we to assume that you're actually just throwing up a force field at this point? Because I cannot begin to believe that this has worked every single time you've done it. I would way more prefer if he just walked up that thing and went, <laughs> <laughs> shut the fuck up. Do you realize how much funnier that movie would be if he just walked up yeah. and slapped that dinosaur in the face and was like, shut up. <laughs> And the doctor was just like, okay, assert dominance. Yeah, yeah. I would prefer that over this fucking Jedi mind trick garbage. I am going to get her back. I promise you that. Ah, yes. Excellent. Blue the Velociraptor can understand English now. How appropriate, given the rest of the crap she can apparently do. <laughs> I guess it also knew that by coming to him, he knew, he'd know exactly that yeah. they also took the kid. <laughs> yeah. I'm assuming that what I'm supposed to be inferring from this is that Blue came to Owen to ask for help and the two of them shared a moment that assured her that he was going to do so. I'm not going to say that's as stupid as her understanding English, but uh, it's still pretty up there. Like, man, I shouldn't have to be referencing Jurassic Park 3 as the superior example of how to portray Velociraptor intelligence, but goddamn... I guess here we go. The raptors being significantly smarter than the other dinosaurs was always something that was present in this franchise. But Jurassic Park 3 was the one that explored it the most prior to the world films. The movie makes clear that it's going to be more of a focal point due to Alan's research into it as well as the talks he gave on the subject before going to Isla Sorna. During the first attack, we have a scene where Alan is admiring the raptors as they're chirping to one another, noting that they have some rudimentary form Form of communication among their pack. Look Paul! Anything. Paul! <laughs> Get your dumbass over here. Could be a little bit of a stretch, but sure, let's go with it. They also show the raptor's ability to strategize and set up basic traps by injuring somebody, but keeping them alive, thus luring someone in that wants to help him. Could a prehistoric pack hunter have had the cunning intellect necessary to set some kind of trap like this for its prey? I, I don't know, probably not, but maybe. What about the raptor language, though? That's kind of dumb, right? 
Well, yeah, it was stupid at the end because Grant used it to pretend to be one, but in general, not really. The Velociraptors have always had an incredibly extensive vocal range since the beginning of the franchise. It wouldn't be too far-fetched to say that Caw Caw means something different from Screech Screech. This is something that was touched upon as well in 3 when we see the raptor doing its little whimpering chirp thing that's noted to be a call for help. God damn it, Paul's fucked up again. And please don't get me wrong here. I'm not saying that Jurassic Park 3 did smart dinosaurs well. There's a scene where one of them pretends to be in an incubation tube to lure someone in. It, it's really stupid. These smart. things are so smart. <laughs> no, they're not. No, they're not. You're just really dumb. Yeah. They're not even just... I, I really highly doubt that that's what they do. <laughs> no, that thing just committed a murder. <laughs> yeah. like, they kill yeah. for food. Yes. Like, yeah. That's what they do. Yeah. They just, like... <laughs> Nom, your nom, friend. Nom, nom, like nom. they are reasoning like no you're just giving them human characteristics and it's not believable <laughs> but when you think about the alternative in jurassic world we're instead left to conclude that raptors are just straight up humans at this point where they can have full-on debates with one another about whether or not they should betray someone recognize the danger of gas being exposed to an open flame and then making the decision to go up to someone who used to pester them with a click all the time so it can ask for help in recovering their kidnapped child before understanding the concept of a promise and leaving it entirely in their hands because for some reason Colin Trevorrow thinks that smarter equals more human and has written his velociraptors as such and weirdly enough this isn't even one of the biggest complaints about the world movies whether or not it's just the overall success in marketing blue has accrued quite the fan club over the years Years. Very few people actually seem to realize, or even care for that matter, that this weird humanization that's taken place has turned the Velociraptors from a formidable threat that our characters need to be constantly on edge about to just an extra character that doesn't have any lines and will occasionally get pissy with you. But regardless of that, even the people who liked these changes aren't going to get anything from this. Because as of now, I have just covered 90% of Blue's screen time in this film. <laughs> I'll wait for the horrified gasps I've undoubtedly received from the Blue fan club upon this revelation, but yeah, this thing doesn't show up again until the very end of the film for barely longer than 30 seconds. Blue was to Dominion what Jeff Goldblum was to Fallen Kingdom. She showed up for the check. Nonetheless, the stakes have been set and Claire and Owen have a mission before them. Save Maisie and Blue from the horrors of pharmaceutical research. After this, they meet with their buddy Frank. Remember Frank? No. He was the guy from Fallen Kingdom that everyone hated. Well, he's been hired on by the CIA now, so he won't be joining our crew for the upcoming hijinks, receiving the fate of many before him who have also been widely despised by their audiences, quietly and quickly shoved off to the side while hoping everyone forgets about them. He's not doing too bad, though. He got himself an exposition scene. More than I can say for most. Turns out Poacher Guy is called Rain Delacourt, and they've apparently been tracking him for a while. Who is this guy, you may ask? Real piece of work. Ah, unimportant. Got it. But don't you worry. Our little CIA buddy is here to give us a whole bunch of probably classified information detailing the members of his team that are currently undercover in Rain's operation, which also just happens to be the people that Owen used to work with at Jurassic World. What a coincidence! On top of this, he goes into how a mysterious trade-off deal is planned for tomorrow and will be taking place in Malta. He gives them this information and then follows up with, now don't you be going to Malta or anything. Don't you try and insert yourselves in this sting operation that I just fully laid out before you. Don't you do it. Gee, I, I wonder what Owen and Claire are going to be doing in the next scene. What a phenomenally stupid first act, huh? I know for a fact I didn't cover everything that was wrong with it, but there's no way we're going to get done here in under three hours if I try and identify every single brain dead thing that's happened in this opening. We're not even that far in. 
We still have so much more to go. Ah, <laughs> yeah. Coincidence, my favorite. Yes. Well, yeah. ha- please tell me this isn't a fucking three hour long movie, right? No. It's two and a half. You're joking. Two hours and 16 minutes. Yeah. We are currently. I should have just loaded my gun and shot myself. As well. <laughs> Seventeen minutes in. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. 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 You want to hear something even better? This is the B plot. Yeah, man. This isn't even the main story for the movie. <laughs> How amazing is that? You thought we were going to focus on a swashbuckling adventure where our heroes must brave the horrors of dinosaur world in order to find and rescue their adopted daughter. Didn't you? Are you ready to find out what this movie's actually about now? Because I don't know about you, but I'm pretty excited about this. We open on a farm where we see little Timmy and Susie doing their morning chores. West Texas, that's <laughs> West scary. Texas. Do you know how big that is? Like, geez. All right, Ma, I'm here. gonna go feed the raptors. <laughs> West Texas is like literally half the United States. <laughs> <laughs> However, as they're doing so, little Timmy spots something on their fence nearby, and upon closer inspection realizes that it's a locust. A very large locust. Oh. Oh, man. Yeah, now I get it. <laughs> Did you think I was joking when I said that it's about giant grasshoppers? Uh, I... <laughs> that is a big-ass bug. Isn't it? Just wait. You have no idea what this movie's about. You don't I even say. know. You don't even know, boy. Look at that. <laughs> Look at that shit. Are, are those big ass grasshoppers? Yeah. yeah. What yeah. the fuck? You th- fucking locusts. You thought this was a dinosaur Dude, did, movie. Giant. Wait, fucking when did we start Jurassic watching? World turned into no, the Prince gonna, of Egypt all of a sudden. Yeah, that's. I was gonna say, when did we start watching the fucking Prince of Egypt? Afterwards, we get the triumphant reintroduction to Ellie Sattler. And if you haven't seen the original Jurassic Park, you're still going to know this is a character from it. As is the case of every instance of an old character being dragged out of their coffins to reappear in a reboot, the music swells and the camera lingers on her just long enough for you to realize that the movie's waiting for the applause to stop. This is always a good way to gauge how popular a character was in their original movies, by the way. Wait to see how long that introductory shot lingers. Who the fuck is it? Oh, it's uh. Oh, I know you. <laughs> like you know, it's the character from Jurassic Park because they nostalgia baited her. <laughs> yeah, because they had her wear the same shirt. Because otherwise, we wouldn't have. Yeah. And she's old as fuck. Yeah. <laughs> Oh my god! Uh, it's, it's Captain Holdo! <laughs> Remember that character? They huh? look similar, even though they're not they're, acting the same. Yeah, they're the same, they're yeah. wrinkly and old now. Isn't that Remember fun? Remember these people? They've lost all the will to live now. <laughs> this is a paycheck. That standard <laughs> reboot sequel nonsense. Remember Laura Dern? <laughs> Pretty She's much. in so many hits, like The Last Jedi and Jurassic Park. <laughs> the Last Jedi. And Jurassic Park from 1993. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. That's about it. That's her uh, filmography. But yes, Ellie Sattler, everyone. She is, in fact, a character that appears in this movie. We'll give you a brief moment to have an aneurysm about it, but let's not hold too long now. We still have Alan Grant to bring in in a moment. But don't you worry. We're still going to give you a little bit of that creamy center to tease you because no less than two minutes of her being on screen and we're going to have her do the glasses thing. Yeah, you know, the glasses thing. The thing where she's wearing sunglasses, but, but then she takes them off and has a shocked expression underneath it. Yeah, that. Yeah. Yeah, she's doing that again. Give us money for your memories, you worthless car. So Ellie meets with the farm owner where they discuss the strange goings on. I just happened to be looking into this... <laughs> This disturbance of grasshoppers. I just happened to be at a food store right down the road in West Texas during this. Don't ask. Don't ask why I wasn't around the last two movies. I wasn't employed then. Uh, don't know. Don't ask about it. 
Turns out the locust thing has actually been a problem for a little bit of time now. Apparently, they've been wreaking havoc across the entire Midwest, relentlessly devouring all the crops in their paths, with one notable exception. After Ellie does the glasses thing, she notes that one of the fields strangely hasn't been eaten. After questioning this, the farm owner reveals that that's the neighbor's yard who plants all of their crops with biosyn seed. What a coincidence! How about that? What an interesting coincidence that apparently nobody has noticed until this exact moment that Ellie brought it up. What could it possibly mean? Well, fear not, dear viewer, because Jurassic World Dominion is here to guide you through this maze-like conundrum. In the meantime, though, look at this other thing we're gonna plaster all over the screen for you. Oh my god, there he is! Oh there. my god! <laughs> Paleontology is science. Science is about the truth. Remember, he's a paleontologist. Yeah, yeah. Fuck this movie. <laughs> Every time. <laughs> 15 seconds. They held on the Alan Grant reveal for 15 goddamn seconds. I wonder if that was enough time for the audiences to recover from the seizures they were undoubtedly having in the theater seats as their vocal cords ripped and their palms split from the repeated force of being slapped into each other. Salvation has arrived, dear viewer, and it has arrived in the form of a grumbly paleontologist with a hat. <laughs> yeah. I saw the guy from the first movie and I <laughs> Oh, uh, humanity. We could have done great things. <laughs> Not anymore. It's too late. Curse from fucking year 32. <laughs> Don't worry. We'll give you a little extra time to try and pull your spirit back into your body after the spontaneous astral projection that probably just took place. We'll start him off by giving him a couple useless lines about how paleontology is important or something. Oh, oh listen to the music. Life. Oh, remember? Uh, ba, ba, I hate ba, you. Ba. <laughs> da, 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 da. <laughs> there is only ever one good Jurassic movie. <laughs> yeah, it was Jurassic Park 3. <laughs> yeah, the yeah, it was a masterpiece. All that out of the way, now we can move on with the story. Ellie's come down to visit, and she has some exposition to deliver. Ellie Stadler. Alan Grant. Oh, yeah, we're going to do that first. They're going to say their full names to each other. Because these are beloved 90s characters, and we still might be able to get a clap out of a couple of you. Have we numbed everybody yet? No? Well, guess what? Did you know that Ellie's also divorced now? Yeah, man. Remember how you didn't like how Ellie married someone else in Jurassic Park 3? Well, he's in hell now, so she can get together with Alan instead. <laughs> Christ, I hate it so much. Are they gonna meet? Welcome to Jurassic Dominion. Okay, I think we're good now. Story stuff, let's go. After the pleasantries are taken care of, da, 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 da. <laughs> it's still playing. <laughs> Why? Yes, they're still they're still trying Jesus. to get those couple claps out, man. <laughs> Don't you remember? <laughs> Ellie presents Grant with one of the locusts, which had been conveniently captured during the farm incident. As she breaks down for him, the current running theory is that these things were engineered by Biosyn. At the rate they're multiplying, Ellie predicts there will be millions of them in a very short amount of time, at which point they'll have decimated the crops across the entire country, which will, of course, cause the starvation of livestock and the subsequent collapse of the entire food market. But of course, since 
since they don't eat Biosyn name brand, it would appear that these things were released by them in order to facilitate their control over the entire food market. It's weird, just the, the large part of Nebraska that, uh, that is farmland that was a recent acquisition. Only that one didn't... Uh, yeah. Didn't, didn't get eaten. That's that's weird. Anyway, only wheat can come from this company. <laughs> In other news. Yeah. Anyway, Ellie's asking Grant for help because people trust him or some nonsense. That's all well and good, Ellie, but no, that's not how that works. Contrary to what Jurassic World Dominion wants you to think, the general public of this universe would not give as much of a crap about Alan Grant as you do. In the end, this is just some rando paleontologist. Sure, he'd be a little bit more famous than normal because of the 93 incident, but you are not telling me that he's still receiving significant notoriety from that. Although, maybe I'm underestimating how many people soil themselves at the sight of Alan Grant. After all, every single literate human being has apparently read his book so maybe he is the one to bring in on this little stupid expedition which is a nice little segue to lead us to that idiocy apparently ellie needs to go to the main lab and dinosaur sanctuary that biosyn has over in italy so she can collect samples of dna from these locusts in order to prove they're responsible for their origins alan is meant to act as a witness so sorry but what are they getting hired on to fucking do so okay, so they're discover. Are they discovering yeah. the, uh, the 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 like they're trying to get proof? They're trying to get of proof the, of the, the locusts. They're trying to get proof that the locusts came from Biosyn. What the fuck? Else despite they come having from? a locust, <laughs> despite having one of them, yeah. and, and can take it to to another uh, bio analyst lab, and they can tell you what the fuck it is. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, no, yeah, no, 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 no. It's because no, no. Biosyn rules by. the world. Yep, yeah, yeah, yeah. Biosyn rules the world. Of course, we do have a little bit of a problem with that. That being that you don't exactly get to just go to Dino Sanctuary Genetics Lab whenever you want. And needless to say, if Tim Cook over here is breeding prehistoric grasshoppers to eat the world's food supply, it would rather go without saying that the place isn't exactly going to be open for tourists. But don't you worry, dear viewer. Jurassic World Dominions got you covered. In what is quite the stroke of luck, it turns out that Ian Malcolm works for Biosyn and just happened to throw Ellie an invite recently. Wow, that's remarkable timing. Just out of nowhere, huh? Also, you're telling me that this guy can send invites as the in-house philosopher. These morons are out here with generic take over the world plan number nine, and the guy they're paying to be stuck up and pretentious has general public invitation privileges. So that's all it takes. An employee inviting you doesn't even need to be a higher up. You can get an invitation to the Biosyn's genetic laboratories from the guy who babbles about transhumanism in his dementia ridden TED talks. In order to instigate revolutionary change, we must transform human consciousness. And not only that, but you can bring a plus one along too. Cause Alan certainly received no invitation. No wonder the black market is thriving. All it takes is one guy on the inside and you apparently have a completely unfettered in on Dino Walmart. But I digress. What incredibly perfect timing that Malcolm got a job at Biosyn and then sent Ellie an invite now as opposed to literally any other point. This is a coincidence that the movie even commented upon, indicating that even Trevorrow was aware that this was a touch out of nowhere. And he just happened to invite you out of the blue. But of course, its addressal is simply present for the sake of waving it off as Ellie gives us a throwaway line that he wants her to see something. And so, after flying to the sanctuary, Alan and Ellie are greeted by this guy, who will now sadly be remembered for being in this movie rather than Archive 81. Meet Ramsey Cole, the guy who restores VHS tapes for Biosyn, but more importantly, our little guide dude who will be telling us about what they do. Now, I know it's a little early to be saying, but are you sure you want to do this movie? Introducing a brand new character into the story when you already have to juggle Owen, Claire, Maisie, Grant, Ellie, and Malcolm. 
That would be a hefty task for a television series, much less a two and a half hour movie. As it stands, there's already no way in hell you're going to be able to give an equal amount of focus to everyone you're trying to cram in here while still being able to stay on course with the plot. Oh well, I'm sure you know what you're doing. After some more obligatory Alan Grant and Ellie Sattler gushing, the group gets onto another plane to be flown to the actual main base. This scene serves to mainly be an exposition piece for what Biosyn does here and how they're set up, with the occasional break being the ooh, look at the pretty sauropod scene that has to be in every single one of these movies for some reason. Oh my god, there it is again! <laughs> Dude, I could be seeing dragons this often and I would have gotten over it by now. Yep, yeah, I get it, Dominion. You still want me to be awestruck by dinosaurs. I don't know how you could have made it any more clear, honestly. Is that Dreadnoughtus? You're basically that annoying uncle who knows how to do the coin behind the ear trick and does it every single time he comes over while at the same time expecting you to clap about it. They already did this scene. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> We're doing it again. But they didn't do it. But they didn't do it with these characters. Be yet. awe inspired, damn it. <laughs> <laughs> you never get used to it. Translation, we know this trick doesn't work anymore and hasn't since Lost World, but we're putting this line in so we can hopefully implant into your subconscious that you don't ever get used to it so you can proceed to cream yourselves over ham-fisted animatronics that somehow look worse than they did in 1993. You guys really just can't do this crap without Stan Winston, can you? <laughs> Me. We Ow. rescued these guys from the breeding farm. <laughs> Got your finger, bitch. Dude. Dude, okay. Her this. name's Tabitha now. <laughs> Look at this. You see that? You see that so fucking you thing? stole a pet. You see that motherfucker right there? You see kill. that? If I saw that, I wouldn't go anywhere near that shit. Yeah, that yeah. thing looks like it'll kill me. I've oh, seen oh, snapping pet. turtles Fuck shit up. I wouldn't try also, anything yeah. like okay, this. Might so I out offer the counter that this one eats grass, so therefore it is nice. Yeah, again, yeah. like, three people have died, like, in the past week in Yellowstone <laughs> yeah. from being gored by a bison. Kangaroo! Kangaroo! Can, 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 they can, are a violent little piece of shit. Yeah. They wait in bodies of water <laughs> to drown people <laughs> because they're psychopath animals. <laughs> but oh, let's uh, still attack the fucking thing that literally has a forehead built to kill you. But once again, I digress. I'm sorry, it's easy to do with this movie. Our latest exposition dump gives us a detailed rundown about the sanctuary and how it all works. Isla Sorna is briefly brought up, so Colin can assure you he hasn't forgotten about it, as we learn that the majority of the dinosaurs present here are from that island, as well as however many were rounded up from the mansion breakout. I'm almost positive there are continuity errors here particularly with the Isla Sorna comment. It rather reminds me of Fallen Kingdom, where the entire plot was kicked off with the claim that if the dinosaurs on Nublar die, they'll be extinct again. We obviously knew that this wasn't true because of the existence of Sorna, but other than a throwaway line, Fallen Kingdom entirely pretended like it didn't exist. And no, before anyone says, I don't care about all the third-party crap I could read about it. For those who don't know, during the marketing of Jurassic World and Fallen Kingdom, there was a plethora of third-party text you could read that fills in a lot of these gaps. In particular, it states that InGen rounded up all of the dinosaurs on Sorna and took them to Nublar to be used for the opening of the World Park. As such, it's implied that Sorna is completely barren now and all the dinosaurs that did exist at that time were only on Isla Nublar. And don't you know, it's canon, so we have to take it into consideration when talking about it. First off, let's ignore the fact that this is a very obvious last minute patch job where the PR team realized this wasn't in the script and went, oh crap, uh, uh, there, there aren't dinosaurs on that island anymore. Nope. 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 InGen got them all. Every single one. Let's just ignore all that for now so that I can say 
that there's no way in hell I'm going to pour myself over all of the Fallen Kingdom promotional material in order to explain stupid crap that's in this movie. And what's more, I shouldn't have to. There's plenty of big budget, lore extensive movies out there that have all the necessary information in them to explain what would otherwise be a glaring plot hole or an inconsistency in the story. If they can do it, why can't you, Jurassic World Dominion? Why do I need to put forth the extra work to go find a story on some promo website that nobody goes to anymore in order to explain why this franchise is selectively forgetting important parts of its own universe? How am I to determine what is actually canon and what isn't? And more importantly, what if all these extra bits that weren't even in the movie create more problems for the movie that it's trying to fix? You know, like it does here. How did Biosyn get dinosaurs off of Isla Sorna if there weren't any left there? And in addition to that, some of these websites aren't even available anymore without use of the Wayback Machine, because Universal wanted to direct attention away from them and to all their new totally canon websites. As a result, it not only makes it even more difficult to determine what these morons are haphazardly throwing around as canon, but even just finding the information in the first place is a tedious as hell chore for anyone who just wants to understand crap. When a question is posed about a lack of information in the film, your defense should not depend on a website that isn't even accessible anymore. So no, I'm not going to go on an Easter egg hunt to try and explain away all the tiny pieces of idiocy because the PR department had a side project. All indigenous, nothing stocked except for the deer population. It's a great mezzanine species for the apex predator. Oh, the apex predator. Is this dialogue it's dude this is most of the movie <laughs> <laughs> like why is it just so stale and no subtlety apparently there's an air deterrent system that's commented upon ramsey states that this is because the area is a restricted fly zone and it keeps the pterosaurs flying under a certain altitude he gives us no other information so I have no idea how it's supposed to do that. But it's important for later on, so keep it in mind. We're told the Giganotosaurus is present in this area, so we can have some foreshadowing of who the big bad for today is going to be. And then we get into the discussion of the mind control devices. Apparently, Biosyn has installed Neuralink into all of the dinosaurs and uses it as a herding system by sending signals to their brains. Like shots. Uh... No, like, like signals. It struck you as a little bit cruel. Uh, cruel. Do you know how much voltage was in the electric fences of Jurassic Park? Yeah. So, yeah, that's not an equal comparison, Mr. Ramsey Cole. It's interesting to me that you're trying to make it. Well, you see. You don't I have like your fence mounted in your fence. brain. But I like how it's just like, do you know how much is in the in the fence? It's just like, well, that's different. That was a well, fence. Yeah, yeah, this yeah. Is in the you don't brain. have that in your You're brain. You're inserting the fence into their brain stem. There's a little bit of a difference. <laughs> also, yeah, let's just turn this around on you, <laughs> motherfucker. <laughs> you guys were being cruel, so we're allowed to as well. <laughs> A perimeter fence is a system where the animals will eventually learn what they have to do to not experience the pain of being shocked. Oh, wait, no, I'm sorry. The the signal from the electric fences. Signals. It doesn't shock. It doesn't cause pain. It sends signals. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Signals. <laughs> Spiderhead's a pretty good movie that I recommend that is pretty uh, 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 relevant. Fair. Yeah. Yeah, it's just like with an electric fence, it's like the dinosaurs would know, oh, I stay away from that, I get shocked. Yeah. Instead of just, oh my god, my brain is exploding. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> at, at literally like any, at, a, at any moment without, without further notice. But, you know, they could actually see the fence. Yeah. <laughs> you're not even using it as a justification for what you're doing. You're using it as a, yeah, but InGen did this excuse. You're inserting chips into their brains that you can activate at any given time that undoubtedly confuses and startles them with no actual correlation for what's making it happen. This obviously giving them no cause and effect to learn from and thus heaving even more stress onto them than you would be otherwise. So congratulations, Biosyn. You've promoted yourself up to Patrick's 
star holding man rays tickle belt controller. And this isn't even the thing that we're supposed to not like you for. For how much you want me to be an awestruck wonder of these things, you sure are quick to inform me of how much you torture them. What's the difference <laughs> between putting a chip in you and having a, uh, yeah. a, a, a yeah. cage? Man. It's like, man. Oh, it's like, oh yeah, I saw the demolition, man. I did. Yeah. <laughs> Dodson, yeah. Hi. You're Lewis Dodson? I am. How do you do? Ah, excellent. I nearly forgot. You have another character that's part of this whole mix. Can't be forgetting generic Jurassic Park bad guy, now can we? <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> How is this not, like, Tim Cook himself? <laughs> <laughs> Imagine how this guy must have felt when they called him and said, oh, yeah, we're bringing Dotson back. He's like, what? <laughs> <laughs> He's like, oh, yeah, you're going to be the villain, too. It isn't the same guy, though. It is a different actor. Oh, is it? I thought it was the same actor. No, 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 no. The uh, the original actor is in prison currently. <laughs> oh, oh, shit. I gotta yeah. look that up. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, nah, they couldn't get other Dotson back. <laughs> <laughs> We get our reintroduction to Ian Malcolm, and after the mundane pleasantries are finished, Alan and Ellie immediately decide they're going to start talking to him out in the open about the locusts and how they're going to create this horrible ecological collapse and they need to stop it. I like how they were able to do this for these insignificant people, but they couldn't do it for fucking Luke laying on. I know, right? Yeah, right? <laughs> fucking hell. Ugh. I'm... Okay, I'll comment on YouTube being stupid in a moment here, but I'm sorry. I thought this was a dinosaur movie. Jurassic World Dominion, follow up to Fallen Kingdom, where dinosaurs are sharing the earth with humans and what effect that has on the world as a whole. I genuinely thought that was what this movie was going to be. I mean, it's what all your dumbass promotional material would lead us to think. It's what all of the pre-release interviews would lead us to think. It's what the official synopsis of the goddamn movie would lead us to think. Four years after the destruction of Isle Nubla, or Nubla, dinosaurs now live and alongside hot. humans all over the world. This fragile balance will reshape the future and determine once and for all whether human beings are to remain the apex predators on a planet they now share with history's most fearsome creatures in a new era. So based on all your stupid advertising I've been forced to look at for the last six months, I kind of expected to go into this movie and see how dinosaurs were going to be interacting with the modern world, and yet your A plot is about grasshoppers eating the world's food supply because Tim Cook wants more money. I'm going to be completely honest and say that by this point, I had completely forgotten about the dinosaurs loose on the planet because it's barely being addressed. I mean, I don't mean to really intrude on the creative process here, but like, why? Why did you think this was a good idea? Did you guys really just decide that writing a compelling story involving what you set up at the end of the last movie was going to be too hard or something. You had to have some world shattering stakes involving giant grasshoppers because dinosaurs being loose on the world wasn't good enough. Because keep in mind, we are now 40 minutes into this movie and we have seen absolutely zero of the actual ramifications of this crap. Unless you want to be kind and count the news documentary, whatever the hell it was lazily slapped together at the beginning of the film. Other than that, we have seen two apatosaurs bothering a construction crew, Chris Pratt lassoing a random parasaur Rolifus for some reason, Claire being a dumbass with a Triceratops, and Blue getting pissy for a moment. And with the minor exception of Blue, all of these instances are completely self-isolated and irrelevant to the overall story. And to be clear, the only reason I have to exclude Blue from that statement is because her infant being captured is the B-plot. Let that sink in for a moment. The dinosaurs are the B-plot to a Jurassic Park movie. Everything else is giant grasshoppers and deliberate orders from the film to applaud the geriatrics talking about the giant grasshoppers. There's an ironic joke in there somewhere. Something about how the movie is treating its old characters the same way it's treating the sauropods. Hell if I know what it is, though. While Alan and Ellie are continuing to be morons talking about this crap out in the open, Malcolm decides he's going to make the conversation a little more private. How does he do this, you may be asking? Well, in what is quite the brilliant move, the man has a Starbucks employee start up a coffee machine, indicating that he's going to cover the sound of their voices up or something, then proceeds to make an obvious glance towards the security system before getting really close in and whispering to Ellie about what she has to do. What are you doing, Ian? If 
you're actually thinking people are listening in and watching you, what exactly makes you think that this is going to be any more inconspicuous? Like, goddamn, you might as well have just had Alan and Ellie continue talking to you in front of everyone, because at least that could sort of be passed off as hiding out in the open. These things continue to multiply. We're talking about cascading system-wide effects, Ian. Gosh, that's a drag. You are drawing so much attention to yourself by doing this and... Wait, where the hell did you get that? You're the in-house philosopher. How the hell did you come into having a security bracelet for where they keep the goddamn locusts? Isn't that supposed to kind of be a secret? Or did Ian take this? Did I miss something where he took it? Nope. Nope, he just has it. Okay. So I'm left to assume that Malcolm either stole this off screen somehow, or Biosyn's secret take over the food supply locust farm is free to access for every level of employee there. Either way, what the hell is wrong with you people? I haven't even finished reprimanding you two for being stupid in your stealth tactics, and now I have to shift on how Biosyn is apparently run by Pinky and the Brain. Which, how appropriate, in the next scene we get to talk about Pinky and the Brain. Why is he dressed like a homeless man that was taken in and given clothes that don't fit him just right? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I forgot about you the almost bad guy of every Jurassic World movie thus far. Gonna bring us up to our ninth character in the movie, aren't you, Dr. Wu? Can't wait to see what invaluable contributions you're gonna provide to this rapidly sinking ship. In a conversation that is definitely just now happening for the first time, Dr. Wu pleads with Tim Cook that the locusts are getting out of control and that they need to terminate them. Really, this is just another obligatory exposition scene. Nothing to really detail other than the reveal that Dr. Wu was the one who made the locusts. Oh, and Tim Cook is evil and says no to killing them. You will yeah. create more killer dinosaurs, won't you? <laughs> <laughs> But locusts aren't dinosaurs. The audience doesn't care what a dinosaur is. You will create more Bugasaurus Rex. <laughs> we don't want to cause a panic. We want control. There's no such thing. Ah, yes. You briefly remembered you were a Jurassic Park movie, didn't you, Dominion? Bashing us over the head with your narrative theme in true modern movie fashion. You might as well have just had Wu look into the camera when he said that. Fair enough, though. You're basically on par with every single other Jurassic Park sequel at that statement. I look forward to seeing the unending stream of dumbass security measures and stupid decisions everyone's going to make, which will then put them into positions where these animals are going to get out and eat everybody. So so you can turn to the screen and go, <gasps> nature is a mistress that cannot be tamed. It's like watching a 40 year old man riding a bicycle with training wheels while telling everyone to look at him. It'd be adorable if it weren't so depressing to look at. The locust's prehistoric DNA has made them stronger than they should be. They're multiplying like crazy and they're not dying. This is gonna be a global famine. How did you not know that was gonna happen exactly? <laughs> like, you're you're a gigantic scientist, so you didn't think, huh? What happened if me make billions of big bug? Do you only eat big leaf? Yeah, they only like, eat big leaf. Yeah, yeah. Dude, it's like they do this conversation every movie. Oh, I didn't think that was gonna happen. Jesus. And what exactly is going on with you, Dotson, you little Bond villain knockoff? So your whole motivation is that you want to control the world's food supply and more money, I guess. And I'm certainly not one to judge or anything, Mr. Larry Fink, but I love how we received the exposition on what your evil plan was from the good guys who were theorizing on what you could possibly be doing. I guess they just full on hit the nail on the head because we receive absolutely no more information on what this idiot is trying to do for the rest of the movie. The remainder of his screen time is him casually brooding around the facility doing evil things before his abrupt and hastily forgotten about demise takes place so yeah that's that's it i guess dotson's evil plan is exactly what ellie said it was earlier no other context no other driving motivation no stupid twist halfway through that puts everything in a different light nope you're just getting a different flavor of big corporation bad thanks universal
little bit of an addendum here. Since Universal recently released the extended version of this thing, we were obviously provided with additional context that wasn't present in the theatrical cut. All of this was released after my script was already finished and recorded, so rather than redrafting again, I'll just be giving you the footnotes. As you can imagine, the extended cut fixes absolutely nothing. We get a few extra dinosaur shots, the camera lingers on certain things longer, Blue kills these random ass hunters, and we see that the Parasaurolophus that Owen saved was actually taken by the poachers and probably killed. So good job on that, Owen. Rather detracts from the whole touching scene of you violently separating it from its herd and then promising to get it somewhere safe, huh? But what we're going to be talking about here is the deleted scene where we actually find out what the villain's motivations are. In an act of shocking ingenuity, the filmmakers decided that that wasn't important enough to leave in the theatrical cut. You know, the version that pretty much everyone was going to see. In the later portion of the film, we see Tim Cook deleting files for something called Hexapod Allies. This bit is in the theatrical cut, but the differences begin once we see a message saying that the files are located on the main server and need to be deleted from there. As he's doing this, he's confronted by none other than Ramsey. And what is Ramsey's purpose in this scene, you may ask? Well, it's there so there's someone to bounce dialogue off of, so Ramsey can then proceed to explain to Tim Cook what the grand plan was with the locusts. Yeah, that's, that, that's, not, a, that's not a joke, that's what happens. Ramsey explains the bad guy plan to the bad guy. Because, you know, obviously. So it turns out Tim Cook wasn't trying to take control of the world's food supply. What he was actually trying to do was use the locust to spread genetic modifications to crops that would make them resistant to droughts, freezes, and disease. But, whoopsie daisy, turns out he made it so that they eat everything except for their brand. So now it just looks like he's trying to take control of the food market. Nah, 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 that was just an oversight. He didn't mean to do it like that. He, he didn't mean to program these things to eat every single crop that isn't sold from his organization. Yeah, yeah, that was an accident. Benevolent Apple over here was just trying to help. But of course, the obvious isn't addressed in any fashion whatsoever. Ramsey is sitting here being the beacon of virtue saying, No, own up to your mistakes. Share your research with the world. Don't delete it all. When in reality, he should be saying, What the hell is wrong with you, you lunatic? You wanted to use prehistoric grasshoppers to genetically alter other people's crops without telling them. What the hell kind of goofy ass cartoon mad scientist idea is that? How did you honestly think people were going to react to that even if it all went to plan? First off, why wouldn't you tell people this is what you were doing? Uh oh yeah, because absolutely nobody would agree to it. Silly me. Also, you're using locusts to do this. Why? Why wouldn't you just sell your own genetically altered crops that do the things that you're advertising? Why did you decide it would be better to release these hordes of giant insects to wreak havoc across the world when that world is still dealing with all the dinosaurs that you haven't rounded up yet? Like, come on, Dotson. The idiots in Fallen Kingdom gathered all these things up in a couple hours while a volcano was going off. It took you three years to capture one T-Rex. Took fish and wildlife three years to catch the T-Rex. Now I know some of you may be asking, why would they cut this? This is obviously an incredibly important piece of the story. Why would they leave it out? And honestly, if you want the answer, it's because the story wasn't important to these people. I mean, Duh, obviously. But this is really the proverbial hammer coming down onto the nail. The story was so incredibly unimportant to these filmmakers that they decided that the villain's motivations were expendable so they could fit other things in instead. Telling, isn't it? We'll be coming back to that, don't worry. But enough of all that nonsense. We finally arrive to one of the main sequences of the movie. The Malta bit. Oh yes. We all know and love the Malta bit. And if you don't know about the Malta bit, then man, oh man, are you in for a treat. You have no idea how much stupidity we have to shift through with this part of the movie. The, we're at the Malta scene here. So oh, this is the, God, yes. Yeah. We need to watch the entire Malta scene. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We will. All we of will. it. And we need to be silent throughout. <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe twice. <laughs> maybe twice. Remember Owen and Claire? Yeah, 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 the other main characters of this film. Yeah, we kind of lost them for a bit, didn't we? Seems so long ago, huh? 
Let's see what they've been up to during all this. So to give you a little context on how the plan is going, Biosyn hired evil Elsa to track down Blue's baby that they were at this point just guessing existed. Tim Cook expresses that in the previous scene where we learned that the entire reason they're assuming this is because Wu said so. Blue reproduced all on her own. Just like you said. You're so smart, Henry. They knew about the little raptor. Oh, no, he, he worked it out. <laughs> but that doesn't make sense how that could happen. Because <laughs> they, they didn't learn their lesson in the first movie and they continued to mix their DNA with other animals that could reproduce asexually. <laughs> no, my headcanon is that it's Chris Pratt's baby. <laughs> and you are not taking that away from me. Why do they need this theoretical raptor baby? Don't worry, we'll get into that later. Interestingly, this is a mission that was never actually planned or executed at any point in the last four years that Blue has just been allowed to roam around California uninterrupted. On the contrary, Biosyn does not give a single solitary crap about Blue, even though it's explicitly said that her and her baby are genetically identical, but uh, again, we'll get into that later. It wasn't until this arbitrary amount of time had passed where Wu said, okay, now she has a kid. Did they launch this mission to go look for her? Like, goddamn. So much for the stupid amount of importance you heaved onto her last movie for being the last living velociraptor. All that quickly went straight out the window, and now this thing is completely useless to Biosyn for some reason. So in tandem with her new task from Blackrock, evil Elsa then hires generic poacher dude to go out and track this theoretical baby raptor down for her. But here's the thing. Blue Jr. is only part one of Biosyn's plan. They actually need Maisie as well for plot reasons. And while Delacorte was definitely filled in about the existence of Clone Girl, the mission was certainly for the Raptor. The original plan was to grab Schrodinger's dinosaur and then hold on to it until they were able to find part two to the plan. Why did they need to hire a random shady black market bitch to then go and hire a poacher to capture something that they already own? Because fuck you, that's why. But as I talked about before, in what is the most fortuitous of circumstances, Blue just happened to be hanging out in the exact same spot that Maisie was hanging out in at the exact time that she had this baby, and also the exact time that Biosyn launched this mission to go look for her. Meaning that not only did they find this raptor baby that they didn't even know existed, but they found the little clone girl that they also needed for the second part of this plan. What a coincidence! Like... Oh my god, how many ludicrous and utterly perfect coincidences are we allowed to stack on top of each other before it starts looking a touch on the staged side? And all of that worked out so perfectly pristine to the point that it feels like unholy intervention. And now these two captured plot devices are being flown into Malta. But wait, you may be asking, why Malta? We've already established that Biosyn's stupid UN-run sanctuary is in the mountains of Italy. Why not just fly her straight there instead of taking a random pit stop only to get onto another plane that would then take them to this place? Especially since you already have two airplanes and one of them is being flown by someone who has done different delivery jobs for Biosyn in the past. What exactly is the point of dropping them both off here before taking off again in a different plane? We flew them separately. I'm not taking any chances. Oh, I get it. Because of them, yes. It all makes sense now. Ah, I see. You're just being super extra careful by adding in another step that creates more possibility for something going wrong. You keep beating us over the head with how priceless of assets these two are, and yet you're going to switch planes halfway through the mission just cause, instead of just taking them straight to the drop-off point. And what's this? The CIA just happens to be in town? And they're conducting an undercover operation to bust this guy? Which also happens to coincide with this mission? And despite being a top secret CIA operation, this has been made conveniently privy to Owen and Claire since everyone they personally know are now CIA agents? What a coincidence! But don't worry, dear viewer, we're not quite done yet. For as this trade-off is being made, we're introduced to Kayla, the pilot who transported Blue Jr. She collects her payment for flying over before noticing Maisie walking in between her two checkpoints. She comments about it for some reason, but is predictably told that it's none of her business and to screw off. I wonder if she'll be coming back to any plot-relevant capacity. Probably not. Let's move along.
Like I said, Owen and Claire have been filled in about all of this, and they're here too. Not actually sure what their plan is, since they have no earthly idea when or where this crap is taking place, nor do they have any idea who is associated with Rain Delacourt, so they're quite literally looking for a needle in a haystack, but hey, I guess they're just winging it. And as they're walking down a random Malta street, waiting for the plot to kick in, who should show up but Barry from the first Jurassic World movie? So that's interesting. You just ran into them, huh? All of Malta. While you're in the process of enacting a top secret CIA mission. And you just happened to cross by your old co-workers from the Chimera Zoo. What a quick- And without even missing a beat, as soon as you walk up to them, you begin detailing the plan while describing who Delacourt is working for and where the ambush is taking place. It's kind of surreal, really. Owen and Claire barely even had time to finish the pleasantries before Barry said, Wow! What a completely unplanned coincidence that I ran into you guys. Anyway, here's all our classified intel on what we're doing and who these people are that we're tracking. Here, take these two extra earpieces that I just so happen to have on me so you can keep track of what the men in the field are doing. Now don't you be getting involved with our top secret CIA mission. Don't you do it, Owen. Also, let me show you where the dino black market is and how to get into it. Don't talk to anyone in here. Don't you do it, Claire. Owen and I are going up to the rooftops to provide overwatch duty. But you aren't part of this operation, Owen. Don't you forget that. Now take these binoculars and tell me what you see. I suppose subtlety has never exactly been a strong suit of you guys, huh? <laughs> Fucking feds. <laughs> but wait, what's this? Could it be? It just so happens that Kayla is here at the black market at the exact same time that our main characters came here. What? The person who was paid to ship the little abomination across the world is now at the exact place in Malta that Owen and Claire immediately went to. What a totally random happenstance, dear viewer. The title the of this movie is Jurassic World. <laughs> it's a Spy Kids movie. Give me <laughs> dinosaurs. <laughs> Oh, here they Jacob are. There you go. Jacob look, dinosaurs. a heart attack. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a... Oh, it's a oh my god, those things look so fake. <laughs> Comparatively, I suppose it's not as contrived as some of the other things I've seen in this movie so far. I mean, it's not like this is the first person that Claire approaches and begins pestering about her lost daughter or anything, right? You're American. And that make us friends? Oh, never mind. Yeah, no, I tried, Dominion. I tried to give you the benefit of the doubt. I suppose this means that you'll be bringing this character into the mix now, huh? Tossed into this blender about as haphazardly as the rest of them. We're two people off from having the same amount of characters as Ocean's Eleven, by the way. A film that is almost entirely centered around its characters and the juggling between them. I wonder how that's going to work out for the Chimera Grasshopper movie. Kayla says no nah, and walks off so she can dramatically re-enter again once it's time to do so, leaving Claire alone to continue providing free surveillance for the CIA. This leads us to a bunch of cool building shots and quick zoom showing people running across and setting up the ambush as we follow Delacorte into the underground before he and the undercover agent meet up with evil Elsa. This is a dinosaur movie, by the way. <laughs> in an interesting turn of fate it turns out that the cargo drop being performed isn't actually related to Maisie and Blue Jr. The CIA, being about as efficient at their jobs as ever, completely missed that deal and Delacorte has already moved on to the next one. This is made even more hilarious by the more than likely unintended implication that the undercover agent was a part of the Blue Jr. mission to begin with. As said by evil Elsa herself, My people say the raptor arrived in good condition. You boys didn't cook this up. Amazed. Indicating that not only does she know both of these people, but that the accompanying dumbass with Delacorte was in on the initial planning. Meaning that this dude is either a full-on double agent and the movie never addresses it, or the CIA was in fact aware of the kidnapping of Maisie, did absolutely nothing to stop it, and then purposefully withheld that information from Owen and Claire, while at the same time assigning all the people that they knew to a bust operation in order to bring them in under false circumstances. I'll let your mind run wild on what that could possibly mean. Regardless, Big Bird has a new job for these two morons, and she's quick to reveal it to the audience. What's the cargo? Atrociraptors. Right, so apparently she had a pickup truck with dinosaurs in the back. 
four of them specifically, and all of them have been completely silent this entire time until the canvas was ripped away for dramatic effect. She explains that they're apparently thoroughbred, and I have absolutely no idea what that's supposed to mean, considering these things have been mixed with frogs and lizards from the very onset of their existence. You can't exactly have a purebred dinosaur when there's poison dart frog genetics thrown in as a placeholder. She further explains that these particular raptors have been trained to attack and kill anyone who has a laser sight pointed at them. So you're doing that again, huh? Oh, oh my! Oh, the they're laser doing the fucking laser, <laughs> laser pointer. <laughs> kill the this person. Oh my god. And they go for it. They're doing the laser shit again like the last movie. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's yeah. fucking... A oh, laser pointer at them is like, kill them, and the raptors are like, ah, yes. You've blended the hyper-aggressive apex predators with the behavior of an average house cat, while at the same time expecting your viewer to take it seriously. In the same breath, you're informing the audience that you think it was the hybrid part that they didn't like about the last movie, so you're assuring them that you won't be doing it this time. Incredible. And possibly most hilariously of all, your apology for making hybrid dinosaurs in the last movie is also you doubling down on the dinosaurs in war thing again. Again. You really just can't let that idea go, can you, Colin? This entire scene is basically just Colin Trevorrow saying, See? See, dinosaurs can be used in the military. And I really just find myself not really caring to dissect it. Mainly because plenty of other people have already done so in extensive detail ever since the first World movie came out. And despite all of that, and all of the people who kept saying it was a stupid idea, he still proceeded to include it in every single movie. So... Fine, sure, Colin. You can have your little laser pointer death lizards that you're so insistent on including in these films for whatever reason. It's grown up time. Drones can't search tunnels and caves. Damn, you right, Colin. Military drones definitely can't do that. Better send the velociraptors in to do it. We can airdrop them in like we did in the Jurassic Park 4 script. Imagine being the guy who has to put a parachute on a velociraptor. Regardless, possibly the most bizarre thing about this whole thing is that it builds from this really weird foundation that insists that predatory dinosaurs are invincible. Never at any point do any of these movies address the counter-argument that the person being attacked could just shoot the dinosaur, you know, because then they'd have to admit that this is a stupid idea that doesn't work. These guys are gonna run straight into the enemy's teeth and die. <laughs> yes. Yes. And They're get shot in the head. What? Well, goddamn! What are you? They, oh, they have scales. You're insane. They have scales. <laughs> hyper intelligence. Yeah, spread hyper no intelligence. <laughs> yeah, we bred these ones with Kevlar. <laughs> Golly. Yeah, we have Kevlar. AT4, let's go. I don't care if it's made of Kevlar. <laughs> Like, I know what that actually means. Tungsten. <laughs> I, we got a, a variable bulletproof cocktail over here. A dinosaur made of diamonds. <laughs> it's made out of adamantine vibranium. Wakandia. The money is dropped and the CIA move in to ambush the two. We get a super cool shootout scene that ends with nobody actually getting shot. And Delacorte runs off. Oh no. Not the CIA. Get the fucking stick up. Get Dragon on the ground. <laughs> this is a Jurassic Park movie. <laughs> <laughs> this is a movie about dinosaurs. And oh, look, she just different. walks away all cool. Yeah. At this point, the movie pretty well falls apart. We've pretty much just embraced full-on Jason Bourne with the occasional giant lizard in it now. Owen, who is definitely not part of the CIA operation, gives chase to Delacorte in the underground. Meanwhile, on the outside, generic action scene chase number seven is going on. Look, What's happening? Like, listen. Oh, that's convenient. Yeah, right? I wonder if they'll get out. 
In the process, he lets a bunch of dinosaurs go, of which ends up being two bigger guys that were released by a single bullet hitting a chain on each of their cages. Interestingly, Delacorte didn't seem to realize that there were dinosaurs in these containers, as he proceeds to look shocked when they come out and start snapping at him. Oh, Why he's, do he's doing the hand thing. He's oh, doing the hand thing. Oh, no, please. <laughs> For the love of God. It made sense in the first <laughs> movie. Oh, my God. Because he trained them. Oh, and now they're killing each other. Holy shit. Dinosaur, as if now we've got these two gigantic fucking predators on the loose, too. <laughs> He's not even looking! He wasn't even looking at the first one correctly! All dinosaurs speak ASL. Yep. <laughs> yeah. So now we have a random ass Carnosaur and a random ass Allosaurus that are just wandering around the building eating people. I, I wonder if the black market people have a contingency for when something like this happens. You know, like a trank dart. Or I don't know. A gun. Well, no. Turns out they don't. I know, right? I'm shocked too. A group of people in a Jurassic Park movie don't know how to handle an escaped animal. Imagine my surprise. What kind of security measures do you suppose any given zoo in this universe has? I bet there's a lot of lawsuits and closures from the monthly lion breakouts. But all that aside, nobody actually knows how to deal with these two predators that just got out, and for that matter, they don't even really seem to care to begin with. They're much more interested in watching Owen and Delacorte have a knife fight in the pit while the dinosaurs behind them are casually gobbling them up like jelly beans. Okay. What the hell is actually going on? Look, it's <laughs> happening right there! Look, look! Yeah. <laughs> Hey, yeah, they're just I'm watching, just, they're just just watching these two dudes just fight. Ignoring it completely. I'm just happy they didn't ignore it, absolutely. <laughs> Are these guys seriously cheering about two people fighting? <laughs> oh, shit. Oh, well, no time to think about that, I suppose, because now Delacorte's arm is getting eaten. Interestingly, Owen decides that now is the perfect time to start interrogating him about where Maisie is. <laughs> it doesn't really seem like the appropriate time to interrogate. <laughs> <laughs> okay so i know there are other things going on i know there's other stupid crap but i have to focus on just one thing right now you know i've never particularly considered myself an expert when it comes to interrogation tactics but i've always kind of assumed that the whole motivation behind revealing the secrets to the interrogator would mainly be motivated by the torture stopping if someone's actively being eaten by a dinosaur, I don't really think they're going to be in the state of mind to start discussing their work life. Maybe if you were to do your magical hand thing and shoo away the stego whatever the hell, maybe this dumbass would be a little more lucid to actually talk to you for fear of being thrown in back to it. I don't know! We ended her off the Santos. I don't know where they took her out for that! Oh, never mind. He just told you everything anyway, because... Yeah, and now he's useless to the story, so another dinosaur can randomly break free for no reason and come bite his head off. Brilliant. Yeah, and he doesn't care about Chris Pratt, and he's just gonna yeah. walk away. Chris Pratt's not even gonna walk away. He's yeah, just gonna, he's like, gonna stand while this there. dude is just, like, working <laughs> for him. Meanwhile, as the CIA starts surrounding the truck, Elsa appears and gives the order to open the containers. Because I guess that's something the truck driver can do for some reason. Dude even had the controller in his hand, ready to go, meaning that he had to have been holding on to it this entire time. Didn't even have a cup holder to put it in. Also, I love this little shot here where one agent wasn't centered enough when the raptors got out, so he had to quickly run into the circle so he could get surrounded. It's the little things like that, man. Sometimes you realize they really did only have one take. Release the Kraken. Shoot them, shoot them, shoot them, shoot them. Send the hounds. Shoot them, shoot them. Oh, no. If only we had some kind yeah, of... Oh, my God. Some kind of technology but, um, that we could use to protect ourselves. Like some kind of yeah. projectile weapon of some sort. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Shoot them, shoot them. Bang, 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 bang. Hey. Hey, shoot them. Shoot them. Shoot, shoot, shoot them. <laughs> you all have guns. Yeah. Bang, 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 They all deserve to die. Yes. Like, stupid tool in my way. 
<laughs> Thank you. You all shoot have them, guns. Yeah, but me being myself, I can't get over it. Why didn't they bring a tactical unit with rifles and stuff? Uh, wasn't in the budget. Hmm. Punch his gun. He still has a gun on him. He's then why isn't he shooting <laughs> the dinosaur? <laughs> no, no, haven't you seen Black Panther? Firearms are primitive. <laughs> yeah. And so the agents flee for their lives, pistols held securely in their hands, thus beginning one of the most insane portions of this film. And honestly, while I'd love to detail how guns in this universe have some kind of anomalous field around them that makes people just forget that they have them. Let's instead take a moment to appreciate Claire and the nonsense she's about to do. Claire finds Elsa and the two of them have their little mini chase scene, which culminates with a slap fight between them. Afterwards, she begins drilling her about Maisie, and since we're on a time limit, Elsa immediately caves in and lets her know that she was taken to Biosyn. Biosyn. They're taking her to Biosyn. Ah. Why are you telling her this? Uh, because she's, thre she's threatening her life. She, with a she has a tech. You have bested me in combat. <laughs> <laughs> so, to be clear, the entire narrative purpose of this Malta sequence was for Owen to find out from Delacourt that Elsa has their kid, so Claire can then go and find out from Elsa that Biosyn has their kid, so they can go to Biosyn. All of this was basically just a two-step detour to get our characters to the place where they actually need to be. I would say that astonishes me, but I've honestly come to expect this from modern movies. The filler prioritizes the narrative, while every smooth brain in the audience stuffs their face with popcorn and says, Oh my god, I sure hope the Atrociraptor doesn't catch Claire. Sorry, mask slipped there a little bit. Let's take a look at that part, shall we? I, oh, <laughs> fuck, Raptor. No, 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 that's not how it's going to be. No, 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 pointer. The ladies are pointer. Got, okay, it was retarded last movie. It's even more retarded here. So after Claire receives the exact amount of information she needed, a random ass Raptor spawns in off screen and comes screaming into the room after them. I, I rather thought these things were all busy chasing the armed CIA agents, but I suppose one got bored of it and wandered off. Very convenient for the audience who might be falling asleep from the lack of dopamine stimulation because now Elsa can shine the laser pointer at her and cause the raptor to go into murder death mode again. Oh yeah, sorry about that again. I think this movie's starting to make me bitter. But oh no, now the Atrociraptor is going to try and kill Claire. I sure hope that doesn't happen. I sure hope this main character doesn't get killed by a dinosaur in this scene. I'm at the absolute edge of my seat for fear of Claire Deering's life. Yeah, no. Nah. Yeah. No. She's no. she's a no. Man, she quick. Yeah, she quick. She's been she been she quick. been working out. Oh yeah. That dinosaur, <laughs> that dinosaur that doesn't got as good at hops as she does. <laughs> You're not outrunning that. Man. You're not outrunning that. Man. Yeah, you are. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Tom, you underestimate the high Oh, heels. she knows how to do fucking parkour now. <laughs> this raptor sucks. Of course, she's about to suck. Wow. <laughs> yeah, give me a break. Of course they gave her super speed to outrun this dumbass chicken. Are you honestly surprised? The plot armor is now posing triumphantly in the form of spontaneously manifested superpowers. Not only does Claire proceed to outrun this thing, but she does so on the rooftops, performing multiple parkour stunts that the raptor is just that little bit too short on the draw for. And just in case there was ever any doubt, They had to Jeez. push back the, the dinosaur a few yeah. meters yeah. to give her a head start. Yeah. She can notice how every time she, there's more and more distance between what them. What the <laughs> fuck? <laughs> but what's this? Claire done goofed and body slammed into a metal rail? And now she's stuck hanging off of it? Surely this is her end, right? Of course not. The raptor's going to have a random stroke and forget where it is for a moment, which will give the fabric of reality enough time to spawn Kayla in out of nowhere. And Claire will then be able to land on a truck that wasn't there in the previous shot, and it'll have a nice cushiony canvas to break her fall. Oh yeah, and the keys were left in it. You know, just in case it wasn't overkill enough. Oh. Yeah, yeah, good thing you were here. My savior! <laughs> 
Thank you, strong black woman. <laughs> Oh, how how convenient that you were you were just there. <laughs> just like <laughs> Oh, what do you know? The keys are just in the car. Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> now there could be something said about how the raptor continues to chase after them in the truck while keeping speed with it. But I honestly can't find any relevance for it. Man, man, that redhead is so fucking fast. <laughs> Let's check up on Owen and his bright little compadres. Barry got himself stuck in a little cubby hole thing and is about to get eaten by one of the Atrociraptors. Thankfully, he has his trusty sidearm on him, ever present in his hand the whole time he was hiding. I mean, aside from when he momentarily put it down so he could pick up a stick. But that's aside from the point. Play down the stairs. Raptor in the face! <laughs> you have a gun! What do you think he's going to do with it? What do you suppose Barry here is going to do with his gun while a dinosaur is literally spewing saliva into his face trying to get at him? What do you think his plan is, dear viewer? Because if you say anything other than shoot this stupid chimera in its stupid goddamn face, then I regret to inform you that you are absolutely correct. Uh, there you go. Oh my god. You could shoot that <laughs> Why? I mean, that's one thing you can do. You could have shot it in the head. God damn. This is so retarded. Jesus Christ. No, I know. It is, it is. I think the word you're looking for is, is epic. Afterwards, him and Owen trick the thing back into its container, and we get a nice little money shot at how abhorrently terrible the CGI in this movie looks. And as if right on cue, who should come walking around the corner to continue her role as a completely useless presence than evil Elsa herself? who Barry immediately draws his gun on. It's incredible, isn't it? Sometimes you really have to take a step back and soak in and appreciate the raw and unfettered stupidity that these people keep assaulting our eyes with. You now you pull the, the gun off. Off. You <laughs> Now you pull the gun out. What? Brilliant. You have guns. You had a gun. You had this You don't pull a gun. gun out to save your own life when there's raptors everywhere, but you pull the gun out when this random Asian lady walks in. Well, yeah, the hand's not going to work with her. <laughs> <laughs> Just put the hand up with her, like, oh, steady, steady. <laughs> As this is going on, Claire radios in and informs Owen of where the next set piece will be. And so he jumps onto a random ass motorcycle that was conjured up by the hand of God before heading off to the airstrip that she directed him to. But oh no, Elsa has her laser pointer and she pinned him with it at the exact moment that these other two Atrociraptors that weren't here a second ago just happened to be walking by. Oh my God. I hope Owen will be okay. Oh, <laughs> fuck off. Oh. Oh. Where did that come from? Where did that come from? Where, where did those raptors come from? Stupid. Are they just hiding out? <laughs> raptors can teleport now. She, they were just standing off to the thing. side just waiting so for you a know, She outran this dinosaur. Yeah, she outran. I was just about yeah. to say, yeah. she was yeah. outrunning yeah. the raptor, yeah. and this raptor is catching yeah. up with this car that's going like 50 yeah. miles an hour. Yeah, it's no, it's because they were on a roof, and it was slippery up there. Yeah. But she had uh, her Timberlands on. Yes, that. Also, good job, Barry. You had your gun trained on this bitch and still allowed her to put her arms behind her head so she could mark Owen. You're a good fed. You'll be advancing through the ranks pretty quick. But now we have two chase scenes going on back to back where we will be wildly swinging back and forth between Owen getting chased and Claire getting chased. It goes on for a decent amount of time and it's very tense, as you can imagine. Oh my god. Oh, the scene is still going. Uh, I isn't, it, die. isn't it exciting though, Tom? This is killing me. <laughs> I just don't know if these characters are going to be getting out alive. It's really messing me up. I'm pinned to my TV screen in absolute horror as I watch the raptors slow their pace so Owen can make a turn. This sequence does have one of the funnier parts of the movie though, so I guess there's that. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa, they acted like they didn't know they were there. Yeah. Like they just appeared next to Oh them. my god, dinosaurs! They spawned the fuck in. Oh, those have been here for four years? <laughs> <laughs> they just like forgot that they existed and like, okay, yeah. we can put them. Like, how but did they get like, there? They're like now a mile like away. <laughs> and nobody's reacting to it. He's it's just right then. Like, 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 but like, and like far away, they've been driving on these cars forever from that same yes. building. 
Uh, they yeah, see they were they were driving in a circle. You see. Oh. <laughs> oh yes, yes. It's video game city. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> Holy shit! <laughs> <laughs> really? He rode in between them as though he didn't see it. What the fuck? Well, to Dinosaur be fair, place. the guy on the scooter didn't try the hand thing, so yeah. Uh, if, only, uh, if only you put his hands up, then it wouldn't get. Up, he wouldn't have gotten eaten. Hand. Yeah, he would have been fine. <laughs> 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 oh god but yeah this goes on for an absurd amount of time and these things actually end up chasing owen all the way to the airstrip where claire and kayla are taking off yeah these animals don't get tired just so you know completely unlimited stamina we made a lot of enemies here we gotta go he'll be here uh -huh. you know it's really funny to me um i took this seems pilot well <laughs> just like in movies in general like i took flying lessons um and you can't just get into a plane and take off. <laughs> <laughs> like, there's a lot of shit that you have to do. No, you just... you can... no I'm, yeah. I'm not, I'm not saying this movie specifically. I'm just saying, like, movies in general. It's always like, it's always like, oh, yeah, we're escaping. Like, hop well, what if we're somebody was already in the plane getting it ready for takeoff and they just came at the well, right time? Yeah, that... Let me ask you this. What if raptors were chasing you? Yeah. <laughs> Fuck. How much of it could you reasonably skip? <laughs> yeah. yeah. All you, all you um, have to do is look up, push some buttons, uh, press a button on the where the where the um the steering wheel is, and then you're off. Find my old checklist. We get an utterly embarrassing shot of Owen riding his motorcycle into the airplane, and we get one more spooky bit where Colin Trevorrow says to the audience, "Oh, but are they safe now?" <laughs> Raptor jumps on the motorcycle and keeps chasing after them. <laughs> no, see that would actually be that would actually be kind of no. cool. Stupid. Just see, they just look down at the ground. They see it riding. A movie. They see it riding the bike on the water. I'm Wait coming to get you. She let go of holding on to hug him, despite him still struggling to not fall out of the back of the van. Of the uh, whammon moment. So. Yeah, there's that. That was the Malta sequence, everyone. I can't say if I know if there was a single person on the face of the earth that actually was scared for Owen and Claire there, but uh, I guess it's not impossible. Overall, this was, surprise, surprise, completely useless to the story, other than being a weird side detour that just directs us to the story mission and introduces us to whoever the hell this is. Oh yeah, I didn't really get a chance to talk about that, what with all the other crap that was going on. Who the hell are you? Why are you here? How many goddamn characters do you need in this movie, Colin? Do you actually think you're going to be able to give this person any kind of substantial focus to make them a memorable individual? What am I talking about? Of course you don't. But goddamn, that whole scene, that was basically a completely separate movie. I can't even begin to imagine all the idiocy I probably missed in it, but I can only do so much when the film is actively trying to break my neck with all the things that are happening in tandem with one another. And like I said, it was all useless. This is a movie about giant grasshoppers. It just briefly remembered there used to be dinosaurs in this franchise, so it stuck a lollipop in our mouths for a minute. There was absolutely nothing achieved in that section that couldn't have been done with a throwaway line from Nerd Boy here. You know, aside from maybe this introduction, but goddamn, I think the movie could survive if it was missing one of its 78 different characters. You can't honestly tell me that Kayla was needed for the story when this entire filler sequence started off by Owen and Claire just full-on teleporting to this place. You willing to risk your life for people you never met? You want to ask questions or you want to ride? Look at this crap. Even Kayla doesn't know why she's here. Colin Trevorrow just crammed her into the story the way a preschooler forces a triangle peg into a square hole. But uh, who knows? Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe Kayla will end up being the best part of this movie. Can't wait to see if that happens. Shall we check in on how the nursing home is doing in the meantime? Well, let's see. Ramsey is leaving them by themselves and saying to them, you see that direction? Yeah, that direction there, where two people are dropping off those protective suits that are both perfectly your size. Yeah, don't go that way. 
Okay, have fun doing whatever. Now, interesting thing to note about all this currently. For those who have seen the movie, you know what's coming. But for those who haven't, I'm sure this will be a massive surprise for you. Turns out, Ramsey is on our side. However, up to this point, he has been portrayed as the second-hand man to Tim Cook. And on top of that, every time our heroes are talking among themselves about the locusts or conspicuously plotting off in the corner, the movie makes a point to show Ramsey looking after them suspiciously. From the standpoint of the narrative, this is for the sake of making the audience think that he's going to realize what's going on and turn them into Dotson. However, the big reveal in Subversion comes when he reveals out of nowhere that not only is he on their side, not only is he aware of the plan as a whole, but he was the one who told Malcolm about the Locusts in the first place. Now here's where things get interesting. Ellie's plan was to go to Biosyn and get Locust DNA in order to prove that they came from them. Through the massive coincidence of Malcolm inviting her there, she was provided with the opportunity to do so. Upon getting there, her and Alan attempted to speak to Malcolm about it, but he initially brushed it off, much to Ellie's dismay. It wasn't until the conversation was private that he gave her the information about where the locusts were. So while Ellie and Malcolm were in contact, they apparently didn't discuss the plan whatsoever with each other. Otherwise, Ellie wouldn't have been so dismayed when she tried to bring it up to him in the lobby. Malcolm, however, was aware of what she was trying to do and was able to provide her with the security bracelet. Both of them came up with the same idea individually, but only Malcolm knew about it. So right there, we have a little bit of a hole but we'll just string it together with some bubble gum and keep going. Ramsey is aware of the plan. We know he is because the very first thing he says to Alan and Ellie when they meet back up is, Do you have the sample? And the only way he could know this is if he talked to Malcolm about it, meaning that both him and Malcolm have discussed this, but at no point discussed it with Ellie. However, now Malcolm has strangely excluded Ramsey from the planning sequence when he gave the bracelet to Ellie. At no point did he inform her that he's on their side, nor did Ramsey inform her himself until the reveal. Why? Why wouldn't you tell them immediately that you're on their side so you can streamline this as much as possible? Why would you knowingly pretend that you don't know what's going on while just dropping subtle hints on where they need to go? Is Biosyn watching you people or not? Because a possible defense could be that Ramsey is being monitored so he can't actually say anything to them while he's in the lab. That certainly seemed to be the implication when Malcolm was trying to cover up the conversation with a coffee mixer. But you know when that wasn't the case? Do you know when there wasn't a point that they were surrounded by Biosyn employees? Oh yeah, the very first time they met. Oh yeah, the entire plane ride over while he was making excuses for the cattle prods and the dinosaurs' brains. Oh yeah, yeah, he could have gone over the entire plan before they even landed, huh? told them to get the security clearance from Malcolm, saved them from that entire conversation that could have gotten them caught, given them information on the lab, given them information on when the lab would be safe to access and how they'll be disguising it all as a tour the entire time. Yeah, that would uh, that would have streamlined things a little bit, huh? Instead of both him and Malcolm just pretending that they don't know each other at all the entire time, to the point where it almost looks like they want Alan and Ellie to be unaware of his alliance. Man, that's stupid. Man, that's really stupid. All for the sake of having a reveal to the audience that he's a good guy. And now Alan and Ellie are going down to the locust farm that's just conveniently completely empty. It's, nobody's there. A completely abandoned wing ready to be infiltrated by some meddling kids. The locust lab sits before us, completely unguarded, completely unsupervised, and nobody pays attention when somebody's security bracelet accesses it. This is so fucking, like, spies like us doofy. <laughs> slapstick comedy level of these fucking old geriatrics <laughs> like MacGyver not even MacGyvering what am I fucking like uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know Mr. Like, Bean yeah Mr. Beaning their way through a lab like they're fucking like 80 year old <laughs> Mission Impossible <laughs> this is Jurassic Park movie this is so yeah. fucking <laughs> Meanwhile, Nazy is having her own little adventure of exposition to sit through. Normally at this point, I'd start skipping these scenes, but unfortunately, this is incredibly important to the plot. This plot that already has seven different layers of information, convolution, and characters trying to achieve different goals. God damn, I miss Truth or Dare so much. Remember when things were simple and people just died because they were stupid? Back when the most complicated part of a plot was whether or not sacrificing things to Slender Man was a good idea? But uh, yeah, yeah, what new crap do I need to take into account now? All right, so you remember in Fallen Kingdom when we got Maisie's reveal? Yes, I know I've already gone over it, but I'm going over it again. 
This needs to be hammered in for this moment. Grandpa Cromwell was the big sad because his daughter Charlotte died. So he used InGen's cloning technology to bring her back to life in the form of Maisie. John Hammond is big mad about this, which is explicitly stated to be the reason behind their splitting up. This is a major part of Fallen Kingdom and said to be the reason why we never saw this moron in any of the other Jurassic films. He's the black sheep that was outcast by Hammond because of the fact that he used the technology to clone a human human instead of a dinosaur because that's going too far for some reason okay so you got that Maisie's backstory is in your mind now cool you can forget literally all of it because that's not what happened anymore yep turns out while Maisie was dooming the world to dinosaur invasion CERN was screwing with their particle collider again and we all switched timelines we learned that Charlotte was a scientist at InGen she apparently was present through the entire ordeal and was even around on Isla Sorna when they were cloning dinosaurs in the first place then one day Charlotte decided she wanted a kid so she proceeded to clone herself and became pregnant with that clone yeah 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 yeah. she uh she don't need no man if you will yeah yes the ultimate feminist (laughs) Uh. (laughs) this is a film about dinosaurs (laughs) do you fucking think so what the fuck is happening everything is just hunky dory until she's born and charlotte realizes that both she and the baby have some rare genetic disorder charlotte dies from this disorder but not before she was able to alter Maisie's dna to completely eliminate it from her oh but you still only get a half-life because you're a clone of a clone ah she's the she's the perfect clone She's so perfect. Why oh. she's such a dumbass? She'll lead. A, she will usher humanity into a new golden age. <laughs> yeah. This is noted to be a gigantic deal, and that every single cell in Maisie's body was changed, which is something that nobody has ever done before. Apparently, Grandpa Cromwell lied about cloning her himself because he wanted to protect her whatever the hell that means basically that's just the placeholder explanation that writers put into their story when they're tired of trying to plug their own holes up gee grandpa cromwell why did you say that you were the one who cloned me even though it doesn't actually matter and all it does is create problems between you and your business partner also how did john hammond not know in the first place since the whole basis of that previous lie was that i was born after charlotte died and not before was hammond just completely unaware of his best friend daughter having a baby and yet the random low-level jurassic park scientist dude knew about it nobody else just him also why didn't you just say that i was charlotte's daughter instead of lying about where i was cloned from because that's actually a lot less convoluted and makes more sense to default to especially since that was the impression i was under for the first part of my life Hey, why did you lie about lying about where I was cloned from, Grandpa Cromwell? Why did you tell me I was your granddaughter, but then told Hammond that you cloned me? It was to protect you. Okay. How about the ever-growing rip in the space-time continuum, Grandpa Cromwell? Can you explain that to me real quick? Because John Hammond cut ties with you before the events of the first Jurassic Park movie. Since, you know, you told him that you cloned me. But I wasn't actually born until 2007. So now your old explanation of why you never showed up in the old movies doesn't work anymore. Can you break down for me exactly what the hell is going on, Grandpa Cromwell? No. Well, okay, never mind then. So now that we have that shameless retcon out of the way, now we can get on to the big plan. Apparently, Wu needs to study Maisie so that he can figure out how Charlotte was able to completely alter her DNA. Apparently, Charlotte took absolutely no notes about this massive revolution in medical science. She was just completely winging it, but then succeeded with zero negative repercussions to her test subject because she's brilliant. Then we have Blue Jr., How does that thing fit into all of this? Well, you see, Blue was able to have a kid on her own. And Charlotte was able to have a kid on her own. And Blue Jr. hasn't had its DNA stirred up at all. So therefore, Dr. Wu needs it to be a control sample. Yes, you heard that right. Blue Jr. is the control because she was asexually conceived. Yes, the implication is that Maisie and this overgrown chicken are genetically identical and can be used for comparisons to one another during DNA tests. Yes, that is something this movie is trying to sell to you. Notice how they just very quickly skimmed over it while propping all the other crappy exposition in front of it so you didn't give it that much thought. If I could just study you, 
and Beta, whose DNA was never changed. Yeah, that was intentional. No need to fool yourself into thinking it wasn't. Colin knows how stupid that is, but he's putting it in anyway, because otherwise he'd have to think of something different, and we still have action figures to bash into each other. And yeah, this kind of affects some things from earlier. Namely, why did they want to capture the control subject before they captured the one they actually needed? All those aforementioned coincidences that led up to this conversation to begin with. Yeah, it's a good thing that all worked out. Oh yeah, then there's this part. Yeah, this part got messed up a little bit. The whole reason these two are needed is so Wu can create something that kills all the locusts. You know, that thing that Dotson said no to. So is he unaware that that's what Wu is planning on doing with these two? If he's unaware of what Wu is planning, why did he agree to launch an overseas mission to capture this baby velociraptor that he didn't even know existed? Why does he want Maisie? You really think she's the solution? Ah, excellent. So you're aware that Wu needs her to solve the locust problem, but since you said no to killing them, you don't actually know what he's planning on doing with her. You never once asked him what she would be used for before dumping semi-loads of money at this stupid mission that wasn't even for obtaining her. If I can repurpose what she did, I could change the locust DNA, eradicating Oh yeah, Wu just has that on his computer. This is the classified information that Dotson is reprimanding him for allowing Maisie to see. So what? Is he just unaware of the kill the locusts part? He just never watched that far into the video? Oh my god, movie, why do you keep making this villain so confusing? I don't know what he wants, I don't know why he wants it, I don't know what he's aware of, I don't even know how much influence he has over this company. Nobody actually seems to recognize him as an intimidating figure or anything, he's just kind of there with the perpetual expression of a man who has to go to the DMV. Occasionally he gets annoyed and grumbles a little louder. Oh, and hey, look at that, you left Maisie in the room by herself with the key to the Velociraptor pen. Damn, what an unfortunate oversight, huh? Ow. She's gonna walk out. <laughs> really? So since Dotson and Wu are idiots and don't have peripheral vision, they proceeded to stand directly outside of the room with a clear view of Maisie as she stood up from the computer, walked over to the desk, grabbed the security bracelet, went over and talked to the Velociraptor for a moment, and then let it out. All the while, the two of them argued about letting her see the plan that he said no to. Once the gears start moving again, Tim Cook activates the alarm, which ends up spooking the locusts downstairs. This starts the super exciting sequence of watching old people swatting at bugs for a bit. They try to play it off like it's a dangerous situation that they're in, but in reality, it's just a fan service moment. Took a Cialis half an hour. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, turns out there's a perfectly placed teenage girl size hole in Wu's lab. And wouldn't you know it, it has a ladder that leads down to specifically the restricted grasshopper floor, complete with a teenage girl sized door sitting at the exit. Not exactly sure why Biosyn designed their facility with efficient child traversal in mind, but uh. Yeah, pretty lucky for Maisie, huh? Allows her to meet up with Alan and Ellie pretty quickly so they can start exchanging Marvel humor with each other. Oh, and Ellie knew Charlotte, I guess. Or something, I don't know. Colin is trying to turn Maisie into one of the legacy characters. It doesn't work. If you must know the details, Charlotte was very nice and she wanted to do good in the world. That about sums it up. What a brilliant move on the film's part for trying to make me attached to an already dead character when the only point of reference I have for that character is Maisie. You can't keep me here, you're not my mother. Just so you're aware, Colin, you ended the last movie with her unironically unleashing hell upon the world while trying to frame it as sympathetic. Then you spent the entire first half of this movie making her an unreasonable brat with no redeeming qualities other than she likes dinosaurs. And you want me to feel all gushy and warm inside because her clone mom was nice. Don't you love how all of the children in the Jurassic movies progressively become more and more insufferable after the first film? You want some nostalgia? You remember when the stupidest part of someone's character was a payoff to something that was set up? What the fuck is this? <laughs> what the fuck am I watching? Just wait. Wait for what? What the fuck was no, that? Just wait. What? <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ! What? Oh my God, I got what? impaled. What the fuck? Yeah. Bro, what the fuck? <laughs> what the fuck was that? Who wrote that? 
<laughs> Steven Spielberg. But it doesn't make sense because she just got cut from the team. She's supposed to suck, so it doesn't make any sense. Hmm. Plot hole. Yup. The school cut you from the team? Well, he just addressed it, though. Yeah, he, he did address it. There was a line. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> and now we have this little abomination of nature opening the gates of hell while having a tear in her eye over it before ruining the lives of the two people that decide to try and take care of her afterwards. Uh, okay, we need to move on. There's not really much else to cover with this little twerp. Let's check in on her adoptive parents that are trying to rescue her for some reason. So our little trio of dumbasses have just made it into Biosyn airspace, and Kayla is radioing in, requesting for permission to land, saying that she has cargo. This request is denied because... Obviously, these corporations are 100% keeping track of all the planes that are going in and out of this place. Not, not sure what you were expecting there, Kayla. Tim Cook is then pulled aside by Evil Henchman 1, in which he informs him that he spoke with Evil Elsa, who told him that it's Maisie's parents. How does Elsa know this, despite the fact that she didn't see any kind of interaction between Owen, Claire, and Kayla, and was also supposedly arrested by the CIA? That's a good question. Logically speaking, it's probably because she's a Fed, too. But with that being said, I also can't say I'd be surprised if Colin just forgot that he had her arrested. Wouldn't be the first time I've seen that happen. So what is our little Apple CEO to do about this little conundrum? Well, if you recall from earlier, Biosyn has some magical air defense system that we never actually get to learn about that keeps the pterosaurs from A, attacking over flying planes, and B, just straight up leaving the sanctuary. In a brilliant strategy of which only the highest of IQs could achieve, Tim Cook orders that the ADS be shut off, so that he can then hope that a random pterosaur or will decide to attack their plane instead of just engaging the anti-aircraft technology that they quite literally just finished threatening Kayla with. Nice try, Kayla. They will down your bird. Yep. Because prehistoric animals in war, don't you know? Okay. Don't Boo-hoop. move. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> don't move. It's got a, got a plane moving in the air, just like, bro. <laughs> Don't make any sudden no movements. <laughs> yeah, but what if the Quetzalcoatl has decided not to go after the plane, you may be asking? Because, you know, first off, unpredictable animal isn't going to necessarily just attack something because it's there. Also, how will it even know that the ADS went down unless they're aware that their masters want them to go on bouncer duty? Well... I don't know what reality you're watching, but here in Jurassic World land, pterosaurs are the bad guys. And also they know what engines are, and that's what has to be targeted in order to bring an aircraft down. No. Wow. <laughs> wow. No. Wow. It just flies off after that. It just yeah. knows. Yeah. Like, it just knows what engines gone. are. <laughs> it just knows what plane engines are. It just goes after it. It sees on fire. It's like, it's yes. Like, all right. They will crash land now. Back I have done pecking, my job. Back to pecking at trees. <laughs> <laughs> now I will go nest. That's, that's so dumb. Dinosaurs and war, goddammit. Naturally, Kayla has something in her plane that tells her when the ADS is turned off. I still have absolutely no idea what this system is or how an old airplane like this would be able to measure it. But there you go. And also, naturally, they're attacked almost instantly as soon as the system goes down because every single pterodactyl was waiting right below their 500 feet limit for the thing to turn off. Beautiful. This plane is going down! Thank you. (laughs) (laughs) So what's the plan now? Our heroes are going down, and since, you know, airplane crashes are fairly violent events, it would stand to reason that you wouldn't want to be present in one. So the progression of logic would suggest that leaving the plane might be in our hero's best interest, right? Well, we have one problem with that. I only got one parachute in it! You don't have parachutes? I wasn't expecting company! I'm sorry, what? I wasn't expecting anybody to be here. I put the <laughs> ejector seat not in either of the two pilot seats at all. Yep. No, in the seat that I, I it, ride the plane in. Right, I put it behind me in your seat because... Smart. Because I wasn't expecting company. <laughs> I, yeah, right. <laughs> you weren't expecting company, so you put the plane's only parachute into the back passenger seat. That's, uh bizarre choice oh well good opportunity to split the group up i guess because now claire's been ejected and owen and kayla are being left to crash into the nearby frozen lake (laughs) 
She pulled the <laughs> air brake. <laughs> she pulled the brakes. <laughs> the brake. Brakes on what? <laughs> the, the parachute brake, Isaiah. Come on. The parachute it's what, fucking gone. It's what, it's what happens when there's holes in your parachute. You pull the brakes. What's the plan? Hold on tight. <laughs> Man, Put your seatbelt so on. They're so dead. <laughs> I don't have seatbelts in those seats. I wasn't expecting any. The uh, seatbelts uh, back. Yeah, you know, I think they're dead. Oh, they're dead. Yeah, they're, they're, they're dead. dead. <laughs> they're dead. Cold water at that t like it would be like concrete. This, of course, gives us the conundrum that plane crashes like this typically kill most people. Their front window is broken and they impacted with the ice and freezing waters at an incredibly high speed. Plus Owen started holding onto this metal bar for some stupid reason, as if this isn't going to instantly break his arm as soon as they touch down. So they're dead, right? They're both absolutely dead. And if they aren't dead, they're most certainly immobile and about to be dead. Oh, of course, naturally. Pop, Not pop only the, the impact yeah. that would have sent yeah. them through that shitty yeah. window, yeah. but they would instantly sure drown. Like, <laughs> when the they're fucking... not wet or injured, not a hair out of place. <laughs> not a not a single damp Chris piece of Pratt clothing. <laughs> sexy as ever. Yep. How much did this movie last? Uh, still like an hour. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry. What did you say? Was an hour? The rest of this movie. Fuck off. We're like, dude. Yeah. We're like Why? halfway through. What do you mean we're halfway through? <laughs> this is the final act, surely. Yeah, no, no, this no, man. The end. We still have like another hour and a half to go. <laughs> what Dude. the fuck is that left? Listen, uh, we listen. They said that there was the apex predator, the Giganotosaurus, and it hasn't killed anyone yet. Well, we still have the problem of what we're gonna do about Claire. She's kind of just got herself lost out in dinosaur land again. How will we ever find her now? She has a tracker for the seat. That she expected to be by herself for. Yeah, that's weird. <laughs> yeah, that's really weird. So she could find herself when she ejects herself <laughs> with her tracker. That's a, no, no, it's the back seat. Yeah. So, when, so when she's piloting, when she wants to eject, she will get out of her pilot seat, go to the back yeah. seat, eject Grab herself, her and then she'll get out her tracking device and track where she is. Hey, haven't you guys yeah. ever lost so yourself? she could find herself. <laughs> because she was not expecting company. She wasn't expecting company. No, no. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, let's take a moment here because we've in fact arrived at a very interesting portion of this movie, namely the dinosaur funhouse portion of the film. This is actually quite exciting because it means we get to skip over a whole bunch. It's at this point of the movie that Colin Trevorrow and his little team of morons had all the characters running around doing menial nonsense. So naturally they utilized it to throw in a new dinosaur set piece every other minute. And that really can't be stressed enough. Keep in mind that all of this was very obviously stuffed in so they could put the more dinosaurs than ever before label on the marketing material. Everybody gets a cameo before being quickly shoved aside so they can usher the next one on stage. Yeah, this movie's a lot of and then, yeah. and then, a lot of, a lot and, of then. and then, yeah. <laughs> And this is going to be very difficult for me to construct an actual critique for because all of it is useless fluff. None of it is important to the story in any fashion whatsoever while still being interwoven with the story. Its whole purpose is blatant and soulless fan service meant to appeal to whatever audience member they have left waiting for the next dopamine hit. So this is how we're structuring this because I really just want to get past it. And I'm sure all of you do too. This segment is essentially the quiet place portion of this film. Is it CGI deer? Yes. Was it? I, 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 didn't actually, I didn't actually pay that close of attention. I was spacing out for a second. <laughs> Understandable. The this movie's kind of bad. <laughs> kinda? <laughs> Motherfucker, kinda? Fuck, he's dead. <laughs> After Claire landed, she's confronted by this thing. It walks right past her so the audience can see that it's blind before it immediately acts like it isn't by doing this. Is it going to eat the deer? Yep. No, because it's an herbivore. No, it's gonna eat well, the next why are we having this shot then? Because it's going to bitch slap the deer <laughs> and kill it. Are you fucking kidding me? Do that. <laughs> 
fuck out of here. Uh, this uh, is well. I want it's, it's, this grass. It's like you you you, you, you see that you dinosaur share. with the really long neck and it's really tall. It's gonna bitch slap this deer away to get this grass that's on the fucking ground. I can't believe it just swatted a fucking yeah, deer. Yeah, long neck for reaching. Despite the fact there's foliage like everywhere, it's just like you're in my fucking spine, fucking Bambi. What a fucking prick. <laughs> What a prick dinosaur. That was pretty great. Why'd he do that? <laughs> Get the fuck away. I want this grass. My grass. This is my fucking bush, dear. <laughs> Think you're gonna eat my berries, bitch? It'll yeah. just assault things because it's a dick. You know, it's a herbivore, but it's still a fucking move. prick. Yeah. It's just a complete dickhead, even though it eats plants like every other yeah. vegan. Right? We get a super tense scene where Claire drops down and attracts its attention before crawling into the water to hopefully avoid it. What does this dinosaur it, fucking want? Then eats want? the impossible don't whoppers. Eat, don't go. It just, it just wants to it just wants to stalk her like a creepy yeah. pervert. It just wants to be a dickhead. Just go eat it's your just fucking an berries, you piece of shit. It's not even trying to, like, eat her. It just, like, ass physically assaulted a deer, ate some berries, and now it's stalking Bryce what Dallas. What are you Howard. doing in my mossy pond right? puddle? Is there something is else I can hit? This is my fucking pond, bitch. She's oh, gonna drink yeah. all the water, and she's gonna be... <laughs> just, uh, just so, you, so you mean... But if it's not gonna eat meat... Does that mean it's just looking for another victim to slap around? I think so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> As you can imagine, I was utterly horrified for her life. <laughs> Is it almost over? Funny, I just wanted to ask the same thing, Shemmy. Uh, yeah, 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 we have, uh, well, we have another hour left. Oh my god, are you serious? <laughs> <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> For those who were lucky enough to have missed suffering through my original works on YouTube, I once reviewed a nifty little piece of media back in the day called The Bye Bye Man. As is the case with most movies I decide to watch, it was obviously a beautiful work of art. But there's one particular scene I'd like to draw a little bit of a comparison to. Our sleepy-eyed protagonist here is on his way to save the day from evil, but unfortunately, his journey to salvation is interrupted. For you see, he was a touch on the distracted side, so so he missed the librarian that was standing in the middle of the road, not getting out of the way for some reason. And because of that, he had himself a little accident. I mean, I don't want to make the obvious joke here, but that's a big object to flip a vehicle like that. When I first reviewed this, I made fun of the fact that this moron emerged from the vehicle with nothing but a limp and a trickle of raspberry syrup on his forehead. I was but a young and naive movie critic at the time, and to me, this was one of the wildest things I could possibly imagine seeing in a film. So Elliot crawls out, and he has a, like a little bit of blood on his face, and that's, uh, that's about it from this massively traumatizing car wreck. He grabs his gun and doesn't even seem phased in the slightest as he carries on approaching the librarian. But what I failed to recognize at the time was that at the very least... He came out of the wreckage with an injury. At the utmost least, I can say that he was inconvenienced when he bumped his head on the steering wheel or whatever the hell. Then you compare that to this. And then you realize, huh, the Bye Bye Man actually did something better than Jurassic World Dominion. That's not a good thing, Colin. That's really not a good thing. The Bye Bye Man was about people that died because they wouldn't stop saying Bye Bye Man. That's the entire premise of the film, Colin. And they still managed to outclass you in something. Anyway, Owen and Claire casually stroll away from the plane crash that they were in. I like how it looks like she has five o'clock shadow on her face. <laughs> before being attacked by another raptor. But oh my god, this one's a pyro raptor. And, and it has feathers. You know, because we can't just use velociraptors anymore. We need to have a constant stream of new crap because... Yeah. The ice cracks open and the pyro raptor dives in. For some reason. Leads to more super tense scenes. I was really scared for Owen in them. 
Okay, I I'm have dead. to ask Jake about this because I call bullshit on this. Jacob would probably have a whole bunch of issues. No, Jake's really mad at the scene. No! 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 He's got no, flippers, no, okay? No! It's fine. No! 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 Yeah, he's no! Got the, uh, it's fine. The, they, no! They, so what happened? It's like Jake? a penguin. What happened, Jake? Why is the it's ice not? not oh, there we go. Oh yeah! Stop it! So what Stop happened? Stop it! Well, I mean, Jake was pretty mad at this entire movie. Oh, okay, no, it's still no. right. It nope. looked like okay. its head exploded. Oh my very god! That, like, no! Stop! Stop it! Stop with this bull! Stop it! No! That's not how raptors work. No, 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 no. God they, damn it! They, I mean, it they had to. Yeah. They had to mix the dinosaur DNA with bird DNA, so it would have feathers, so it would be warm in this cold environment, Jake. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that, that, was, that doesn't uh, mean it can swim. Like a layer of blubber. And it means, and it means it can so swim. It can yeah, yeah. They mixed. It with so, oh no, oh no, we mixed dinosaur DNA. DNA. We, we mix dinosaurs with other dinosaurs so they can have feathers like how they did in real life. That means they can swim like a penguin, which makes no fucking sense. And no, fuck listen. all. Fuck listen. your excuse okay, so of listen. it being a dinosaur pigeons, movie. What about pigeons are tremendous here? swimmers. Yeah. <laughs> One of the most hilarious parts of watching this movie with someone that's knowledgeable about dinosaurs is watching that person get angry at all of the things that they got wrong. This scene isn't necessarily the most egregious example of that. However, it's funny to make particular note of. Hello there, friends. I'm going to now demonstrate why Hollywood directors and producers should not at all talk about science. First day with our Dimetrodon animatronic on set, we also have Laura Dern and Sam Neill fighting a dinosaur, which is something we haven't seen for We also have Laura Dern and Sam Neill fighting a dinosaur. We also have Laura Dern and Sam Neill fighting a dinosaur. Fighting a dinosaur. Fighting a dinosaur. 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 Oh no, it was a dinosaur. No. 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 <laughs> okay, so. So the fact that the fucking troglodyte retarded p fucking dumbass up there said, Oh, there's dinosaurs oh everywhere. The fucking Dimetrodon, even the Dimetrodon's a proto mammal. It's not even a fucking reptile. But they're like human from skulls the down here? <laughs> from the fucking Permian. Why is there a, yeah. why is there a Dimetrodon? Oh no, the hat. In the dinosaur hat. moment. He needs his hat. <laughs> The Dimetrodon's not even doing anything. It's just standing there, opening it's just its like mouth, sitting there, like going, <laughs> well, I'm, a I'm a dinosaur. <laughs> it's animatronic. No, though. they didn't have Stop time it. to animate. Tom, I will, I will find where you live and I will eat your anything. fucking soul. <laughs> Apparently, Dominion had a paleontologist or some such dino expert on set during the production. This is especially hilarious considering they clearly gave as much of a damn about the movie as the rest of the crew did. Regardless, this is the latest stop on the roller coaster, so let's take a brief look at it. Apparently, Evil Henchman 1 is just now getting around to informing Tim Cook that their cameras caught Grant and Ellie stealing locust DNA. The excuse we get is that they were busy looking for Maisie, so they just missed it when it was happening. Also, surprise, surprise, everyone, the camera also caught Malcolm giving Ellie his security access, almost like they should have had the meeting... I don't know anywhere else all of this leads up to malcolm getting fired and we get a scene where the two of them have a pretentiousness contest jeff goldblum won but back to the point tim cook sees that the duo are heading to the airfield with the locust dna so he shuts their car down at a point when not only is it an exit way to what grant dubs the old amber mines but also in tandem with the conclusion of our Maisie's mom was really cool conversation no, your mom. Uh -huh. Of course no, you did. did it. <laughs> no, you did it. Stop. I love that they add this stuff after the fact. Yeah. It's like, yeah. oh yeah, you knew your mom, even though we had never seen a clip of it. And then just the, the the way they present it too is like building theme parks is mean. She was trying to do good with it. <laughs> 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 so that's pretty convenient from all fronts. Allows for a very streamlined entrance for the next cameo. No, 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 no. That was not a Dimetrodon swimming like a crocodile. That was not a Dimetrodon swimming like a crocodile. You did yeah, not they, just have they mixed it with crocodile DNA. <laughs> but that makes even less sense. <laughs> After some more Alan and Ellie Shipper fan service, the group is confronted by a bunch of Dimetrodons that 
like everything else in this movie so far, just kind of spawned in when everyone wasn't looking. Something else that's worth noting for this bit, this is unironically the most pathetic action scene in the film. There are a couple reasons for that, but one is obviously the golden plot armor that's been shining directly into my eyes this whole goddamn movie. Yeah, obviously the film that momentarily gave Claire super speed isn't going to put any of the franchise's legacy characters in harm's way. Of course not. Grant might as well go up and slap that Dimetrodon in the face while he's on his way to grab his stupid hat. And this is the extension that brings us to my second point here. At no point do the Dimetrodons ever actually do anything. The whole scene is just Alan, Ellie, and Maisie running away from barely moving animatronics. I wasn't kidding when I said this movie was turning into a funhouse. It genuinely feels like I'm just watching reaction clips of people going through a Halloween maze. I mean, oh no, it's so tense. I sure hope they'll be okay. What if Malcolm doesn't open the door in time, guys? As the Demetrodon is just kind of standing on the minecart directly behind them, not doing anything and just occasionally snapping at them. Let's just remember, all right, let's remember, these two plot lines are happening simultaneously, but have nothing to do with one another. All right, just remember that. <laughs> yeah, have the new characters even met these fucking people? No, no, nope. no, no, no idea. These they two exist. things have nothing to do with one another. Owen and Kayla find Claire's plane seat. A T-Rex walks up and tries to eat the deer from earlier, but then it gets chased away by the Giganotosaurus that Kayla is somehow aware of. That's pretty much the entire scene. Moving on. They could not hear it approaching from nope. a further distance. Nope. <laughs> it seems that the dinosaurs are just idle in, in one position, and the characters just happen to walk past them. <laughs> and that's their cue to start moving. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm really confused about this location How so? because this seems like a, a you know tropical temperate mm -hmm. place, mm -hmm. but then just a few miles away, it's fucking a frozen lake. Snow everywhere. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> what's going on here? It's science. Science. Yeah, science. That one. Science, bitch. Evil corporation. <laughs> well, that got tropical, really close. <laughs> tropical hot in walking distance to freezing yeah. cold lake. With yeah. Snow everywhere. Claire comes to a new structure where she encounters a bunch of Dilophosaurs. Yeah, remember these things. The venom spitters that John Hammond put behind a fence in the first movie? So here, as we pass by, in the uh, the wire fence... Of the spit's venom. Yeah. Like, excuse? That's a problem. That's that's a problem with the park there, Mr. Hammond. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. unsafe as yeah, fuck. Yeah. Goodness me. Oh, God. We spared no expense. Spared no expense. Yeah, well, they're back now. So you can dream of better times once again as one goes up to Claire and starts getting pissy with her for a second. Then Owen walks up and chokes it. Because, you know, of course he does. Yes, that... Oh, oh my God. What the fuck? <laughs> what? No. I look... No. It's so bad. No. Uh -huh. He grabbed it as though it was a damn dog. <laughs> Like, how dare you? It's like, no biting. No biting. Bad. I taught you better than that. <laughs> Rolled up newspaper. <laughs> All right. No biting. So, so, as far as storytelling goes, why did they have to be separate for those few minutes? Uh, to fit in more scenes of more dinosaurs attacking them. Yeah, I, I, I don't really know what else to say about that. Other than holy goddamn crap, why can't we have something happen to these people? Being a main character should not excuse you from every and any kind of harm. And in fact, it makes your movie a lot more interesting when they can be heard. Imagine if the Dilophosaurus had ended up spitting into Claire's eyes before Owen was able to get to it. For those who don't know, the first movie established that their venom was meant to blind and eventually paralyze their prey. Imagine if Owen would have been a second too late, and then he had to try and save Claire from the venom before it paralyzed her. It would have added a much needed dynamic to this film that has been so evidently absent throughout. Trying to save someone's life 
rather than jumping onto the next theme park ride. These are the types of things you could put in to actually try and progress your characters instead of just having them be useless action figures to be placed wherever you deem fit. Why would you even bother setting up that Claire is still dealing with internal conflict if you were going to do absolutely nothing about it other than Ellie telling her they're there later on? You clearly don't actually want to give any of these people depth. You just want to throw them into the next dinosaur pit. And that is more apparent than ever in this film in that we have barely even seen Owen and Claire do anything that isn't run from a dinosaur. At least in World and Fallen Kingdom, they kind of had some semblance of agency, but in part due to the massive amount of characters they stuffed into this movie, on top of the massive amount of useless scenes that they stuffed in to check their marketing boxes, I often forget that Owen and Claire are even in this movie. Dude. Nothing has happened in this fucking movie. <laughs> like, they hid the evidence. That's it. That's all that's happened. As I said, all of that nonsense was completely useless. We've waded through Dinosaur Adventure Land, and now we can finally be getting back to the central story. And man... What a point we're about to be picking up at. Tim Cook, while he's busy doing whatever the hell, decides it's time to start disposing of the failed side experiments. He and a couple other scientist people head down to the locust farm, where he begins incinerating them. You would think lighting them on fire is a good idea. <laughs> in a contained room. In a contained box in your yeah. science yeah. lab underground. But wait. Yeah, this problem wait. solved. This yeah, he just walks away. Yeah. My job is done. Yeah. yeah. Put There's my... no way they could get out of yeah. here. Eat my pistachio <laughs> now. <laughs> I'm a villain. <laughs> I got a bag of pretzels in my pocket. Now, I'd like to play a fun little game with you all regarding the events of what are about to follow here. This is also going to double as a biology test. Should be great fun. Dear viewer, I pose you this question. What happens to an insect when you set it on fire? There we go. That should be enough time. I have a pretty decent amount of faith in you people. I won't even ask you to turn in your papers because I'm that confident you arrived at the correct answer. Insects die when they're set on fire. It, it's, it's kind of a trait that's shared by most animals. As they say in the olden times, fire bad, after all. Now, before I tell you what Jurassic World Dominion thinks will happen to an insect that's been set ablaze, let me remind you of a very important detail. They tried to foreshadow this. The locust prehistoric DNA has made them stronger than they should be, and they're not dying. Containment chamber compromised. Oh, Come on, that you. No. Oh, what? The what? fires no. made How? them what? stronger. <laughs> Gee, what the? F what on what earth? The fuck? No. What Wait, on why, earth why am I looking they... at? Why? So no, they're all dead then, right? They're all dead. <laughs> no, no, they're, they're all they... dead. They're on uh, fire. They have they're fire, fire superpowers now. <laughs> <laughs> they, they all turned into the into the locust torch. <laughs> what the What's fuck that? is this? <laughs> What the fuck is this? They're into a fire. shape and like eat They're all the dinosaurs. Fire. They're, They're on fire. They're on fire now. They're turning into a big mouth and start eating everything. Oh look, the forest is on fire oh, now. No. What? <laughs> this movie is is taking the piss. Yeah. I'm sorry about. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> They, they are, are on, on fire. fire. They're on fire. They're, They're on fire. fire. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> And you for still... a fucking real. <laughs> Bruh. Wow, they didn't, they didn't do a good job at containment. No, they really didn't. Bruh. How, oh, how, no. Oh, no. They just <laughs> happened to leave the outer, outside shaft to the containment chamber. We forgot to make our fucking ceiling fireproof. Oh, that doesn't make any we, sense. We forgot to not have a fire. big yeah, yeah. hole uh, at the top of our <laughs> containment shaft. How long At do you least... think a locust would have to be on fire before its wings stop working? That's what I'm saying. <laughs> look, at, look at that! I mean, we could draw some comparisons here, but I think it might be a tad insulting to the good viewers at home. I shouldn't really have to explain to you why this part of the movie is stupid. Because you really don't have to be a film critic to see it. Let's not mince words here. It's not like we've only recently crossed that threshold. 
but I think there's something to be said that this bit in particular made me stop and reconsider some things in my life. Then there's also the fact that Ellie reacts to it like this. She's burning the evidence. It's interesting, Ellie. Cause you know, I just don't think that'd be the first thing I would say if I saw a flaming swarm of grasshoppers flying above me. Realistically, I think I would be assuming it was the Kali Yuga and I'd probably be saying something along the lines of ah! But all that aside, I love how as soon as they start dropping on the car and causing a hazard for everyone, Malcolm thinks to himself, hmm, should I slow down? Should I stop? Nah, let's go faster. And as he proceeds to swerve around the flaming locusts that are pelting the earth, he ultimately ends up hanging the car off of a cliff because, you know, First movie, nostalgia, whatever the hell. I'm sorry. I'm getting tired of trying to come up with new ways to make fun of this crap. There's so much of it, and it just never stops. These filmmakers are just trying to put you into a reminiscent coma so you don't actually have to pay attention to the film. <laughs> That's why this movie's so long. They had to jam all the stupid shit in. <laughs> of just fucking member berries. Remember when the Jeep was hanging off the cliff? Yeah, yeah. Or yeah, the man. fucking remember? RV? Remember Let's when stick it in remember, there. Hey, remember you uh, know fucking remem whatever remember these two the, are they used to be a thing? Remember when the T remember when the T when the T Rex used his chakra to be able to walk up the wall of the paddock? <laughs> remember like when the T Rex fought this dinosaur? Remember when they set remember a swarm? The T-Rex? Remember when they set a swarm of grasshoppers on fire and they survived for like another thirty minutes afterwards? <laughs> they became elemental grasshoppers. <laughs> Yeah, give me a break. There's so much plot armor in that car. There is so much. I'd sooner expect Publisher's Clearinghouse to walk up to my doorstep right now than I would any of these people getting hurt. Oh, oh look. Our yeah, characters are finally cross paths. Bob, There's 20 minutes left. There's like 20 minutes left. <laughs> and they finally cross paths in this 20 minutes. Small world. Right in this. Yeah. <laughs> small, small, time. small yeah. forest. Very small forest. Small enough to have two separate biomes. Oh my universe. god. Ah, yes. Excellent. All the pieces of the prophecy are falling into place quite nicely. All our morons are finally together, and we can take another moment to gawk at these three because we recognize them. And it's so fucking jarring because they all like come out like so disheveled yep. and like Alan Grant's got his hands on his hips like he's so fucking bored like <laughs> no idea where they are. But of course, the reunion is but another cue for the next giant chicken to walk on screen. Let's see, which one is this? Giganotosaurus. Right. Thank you. Very glad that they always wait for you to give their introduction before you have to run away from them. For the most part, this is just another dinosaur set piece. Nothing of real significance to take note of for the most part. More stuff that happened in the first movie, insane amounts of plot armor that's honestly just getting irritating at this point, and ex machina solutions that end up saving the day. However, there are a couple things that are worth consideration to say the least. And since we got all the boring crap out of the way, let's talk about the rest of it. Once the group finally decides to start making their way to the building, they start climbing the ladder towards the outpost thing. The Giga attacks by chomping down on the one part of said ladder that's closed off, miraculously saving Maisie and allowing her to escape before it actually gets to her. While all this is going on, we, the audience, get to marvel at how our characters keep appearing and disappearing from the ground directly below. It's quite fascinating to look at, really. We go from all of them being down there, to just Owen and Claire being down there, then nobody's there, then Owen and Claire are back, then no one again, and then everybody's at the bottom of the ladder again, getting ready to climb, and then in the next shot they've all just teleported up. Bravo like normal, Colin. Although I suppose I shouldn't be that surprised. What with everything else I've seen in this movie, basic continuity hasn't ever struck me as the most important factor to you. And even then, I don't consider it that bad when you compare it to the fact that you just straight up wormholed the whole cast to the top of the catwalk here. I believe this is in part due to the fact that the editors realized that all four of these people wouldn't be able to climb up in the time it took for the Giganotosaurus to spit the cage out. The narrative wonders you can accomplish in the editing room, huh? Meanwhile, Mal 
Malcolm is doing the flare thing again, because of course he is. But this time he's doing it with a still on fire locust that was on the ground. He skewers it with a stick and then proceeds to javelin throw it into the Giga's mouth. This is what happens when he does that. On the okay. Jeep was to build okay. tension, guys. But, but in this, oh, it lasts guys. Like 10 seconds. Oh, watch, no. Watch, watch this. I'm watch down. This. I can't. No. No, 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 no. Pay attention. Pay attention. This is important. Ah, uh, here we go. Oh my god. Now breathe fire. Do it. Oh my god, what the <laughs> fuck? <laughs> it's so stupid. Why is it I like even make fucking it exploding in its mouth? Did it swallow gasoline earlier? <laughs> you know, I'm not even gonna lie. We've seen so much stupid crap up to this point. I don't even think this warrants a note. Sure, Colin. We can put dragons in the movie now. Why the hell not at this point? In the end, this is just the latest glob of primordial insanity that's been served up to us in the conveyor belt. A dinosaur breathing fire for a moment because it ate a flaming locust, even though it did that earlier in the scene and didn't breathe fire. Whatever, man. Now, I know what you must be thinking at this point. Dear God in heaven, how much more could we possibly have left to go through? And I'm here to bring you some of that oh-so-bitter news that we still have like 45 minutes left in this movie. We have already surpassed the length of my Quiet Place 2 video, and depending on how I'm editing, we may have even surpassed Slender Man at this point. And I don't know about you, but I'm starting to lose steam on this one. So, in the interest of all of our sanities, I'm gonna be breaking out Old Reliable here. The beautiful secret weapon of skimming crap so we can actually start wrapping this idiocy up. Don't feel too bad though, because the movie's about to do the exact same thing. I'm just streamlining it so we can get to the points that are actually worth talking about now. Our group of heroes escape from the stupid thing because Kayla manifested a dart gun out of thin air and Claire stabs it in the eye, all happy and good. Meanwhile, Tim Cook realizes that since the universe is currently broken, fire doesn't actually kill things anymore, and because of that, the entire sanctuary is now ablaze. What is even going on? I don't know. <laughs> like, everything's on fire from the fucking locust that didn't die instantly from being on fire. Don't worry, though. The universe is apparently quick to repair itself, because now fire is a threat again, so you need to evacuate the facility while using your mind control shock implants to herd the remaining dinosaurs into emergency containment. Oh, is that the reason why that's there? Okay, alright, so the whole reason that the mind control shock implants were put into the dinosaurs' heads, and the whole reason that it was brought to our attention in the first place, was so that we could gather them all together for the finale. Excellent. The locust. Uh, oh my god, the barber's all gas. Oh, oh my god. god. That thing was in the mud. Are you telling me he went to the island? And looked around. <laughs> Got the barber. <laughs> Fine. <song can. laughs> so and he, he could, knew it was in the yeah. barbasol can too. <laughs> so he could he knew put where it on a look. shelf. Could put it on a shelf and have it there to pick up and look contemplative about someday. But then, oh no, Tim Cook finds out that Ramsey had betrayed him, and it's a big heavy reveal. I guess. Probably would have had a little more impact if I knew what the hell you were trying to accomplish, but whatever. You die in the next scene anyway. Oh yeah, sorry, I'm skimming over that too, because the movie basically skimmed over it as well. Basically, he grabs the Barbasol can from the first movie and goes down into the tunnels where he dies to a bunch of Dilophosaurs. Because, yeah, obviously they're going to parallel this idiot's death with Nedry's. This is Colin Trevorrow's version of Multi-Layered. What's your story? <laughs> What's your story? What does that mean? <laughs> Wait a what? second, no. guys. Let's reason. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't put my hand up. Damn it. I knew I messed up. Yeah, yeah. What a beautifully underwhelming demise to a villain that I could barely even figure out was a villain. It makes it all the more hilarious because none of our characters actually find out about it on screen. He died as he lived dismissed and in the background, overshadowed by all the nostalgia baiting that ended up suffocating him into submission. And in the same spirit as Jurassic World Dominion, I will now proceed to completely ignore and forget about his existence. Let's keep this train moving, shall we?
And I guess uh, we're just gonna forget about Beta for yeah. Where the, the fuck is that Ooh. little shit? <laughs> the little baby raptor. <laughs> just... Who's Beta? Chris Pratt's son. The baby raptor. <laughs> oh, so now we have a new stupid subplot to deal with. Everything is on fire. And that's bad. So it would probably be in the best interest of our little gaggle of monkeys to vacate the area sometime soon. However, there is a little bit of an issue that comes with that. The ADS is still down, meaning that it would be impossible to leave the sanctuary without being attacked by pterosaurs. We turn the ADS back on, we go home. Who the fuck Wait, are you? <laughs> okay, hang on. I'm sorry, you mean the ADS has been down this entire time since the airplane crash? Oh my god, that was so long ago. You morons didn't turn it back on after it went down? What? Like, like, why not? Wait, what's an ADS? Aerial deterrent system. You know, for the pterodactyls and shit. Uh, I'm sorry, did I just have a stroke? I feel like I've heard this conversation already. Restricted airspace. Protects the airborne life. Keeps the pterosaurs below 500 feet. Okay, never mind. I'm good. They just wrote in Ellie asking the same question twice. Brilliant. No, they they forgot that they already did that earlier in the movie, and then they like <laughs> oh, explained it to it her again. again. Ellie kind of just forgot that. And I went back to check the first time I watched it. I was question. like, wait a second. She asked that, and they answered her and explained it to her already, and she's asking <laughs> yeah. again at the end of the movie. And they put like, they forgot again. it happened. Yeah. If Danny can forget that. about the Iron Fleet, she can forget that she asked the question to that dude. <laughs> oh. So now the new dumbass goal is set. While Alan, Maisie, and Owen are out in search of Blue Jr., Ellie and Claire are off to restart the ADS. I wonder what technique they're going to use to catch the raptor with. Hey! Eyes on me! Oh my god, shut the fuck up. <laughs> Oh my god! Oh my god! <laughs> oh no 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 no! no. Did it get bigger? <laughs> Everyone, Zig Heil. I hate this. This is so shoot it! Shoot god her. damn it! Just shoot! Shoot her! <laughs> <laughs> oh wow! Look, the hand thing didn't fucking work. Ellie and Claire's adventure of stupidity isn't really worth that much of an in-depth look either. I suppose it is worth mentioning that this is where we get the big character payoff for Claire. You know that thing that's been building up for the last three movies? The I am sad because I was mean to dinosaurs character arc? In Jurassic World, she cried a little over it. In Fallen Kingdom, she formed some dino activist group that was supposed to save them or something and then in this movie she joined PETA. All the while breadcrumbs of character were sprinkled throughout by means of other characters telling us that she feels guilty about her previous apathy and now all of that is about to come to a head in the scene. The full wrap up to Claire Deering's character arc. Are you ready for this dear viewer? I have a lot of regrets. Yeah. We hold on to regret and we stay in the past. Yep, there you go. That's done. Ellie told her to get over it. Brilliant, Colin. You didn't even have her do something that actually saved a dinosaur or resolved her unaddressed feelings. You just had her shrug it off because the movie's almost over. You know, maybe if you didn't stuff 40 different people into this film, you could have actually done something with the character arc you've been building for the last three movies. Provided I, I use the word building very loosely, but regardless, I know I've already gone over this. I know, I'm sorry, but I'm not letting this go. I'm not going to let go how stupid this is. Owen and Claire were the only main characters of World and Fallen Kingdom. And because of that, we, the audience, could focus on Owen only them, and whatever half-assed personalities you gave them. I suppose we could look at it from the perspective that Claire at least got... something. Owen is still the exact same person he was in the first movie. That being Chris Pratt, of course. This poor bastard's getting typecast worse than Ryan Reynolds and Samuel L. Jackson at this point. No one ever consulted me on what my backstory was. Eh, color me shocked, Chris. But I digress. The movies, for how stupid and bad they were, at least only had two main characters that it could center its conflict on. But in the ever-growing need for remembering the good times, Dominion dragged these poor lost souls back into the fold. Meaning that Owen and Claire have been haphazardly shoved 
to the side in favor of watching the original trio again. It doesn't even feel like Colin wanted them to be in the movie and only included them because he had to. Their existence was relegated to the random dinosaur set pieces and the Malta bit. And other than that, we're just watching Sam Neill, Jeff Goldblum, and Laura Dern wandering around Biosyn. And no, don't say it's them trying to nod to the originals. It's not. It's Universal trying to profit off of your memories. If these morons gave any kind of a damn about the original trio of Jurassic Park, they would have made them the main characters in Jurassic World and Fallen Kingdom. They wouldn't have sloppily stuffed them back into their costumes in the third installment while just dumping loads of fan service into our faces over it. Don't get me wrong, I'm all for watching Alan Grant, Ian Malcolm, and Ellie Goulding doing dinosaur stuff again, but I have this stingy prerequisite of it not being insulting to the intelligence. I know, aren't I an asshole? But again, I shouldn't have to say that Jurassic Park Goddamn 3 did something better than you, Dominion. In the end, we're left with this ludicrous enigma of a film. Owen and Claire have been obviously and blatantly shunned in favor of older characters, thus making it so any character development or arcs that were set up in previous films have to be brushed over simply because they don't have time to focus on them. That time is instead being given to these three, who in a beautiful paradox of irony, cannot receive any character development or arcs in any fashion whatsoever in order to ensure that the maximum amount of people are going to be pleased with their return. Because surprise, surprise, the film industry never actually learns from its mistakes. Oh my god, people didn't like what we did with What's-His-Face in the new Pew Pew Space movie. We better never change a character ever again. But yeah, Claire's character arc is done now. Now we can move on with the shameless recreation of the switching on the power scene from the first movie again. Shot for shot for the most part. Except this time there's a bunch of charred grasshoppers laying on the ground. I'm sure that won't be important though. Uh, they're all definitely dead. Those bitch ones that <laughs> died in the room. Imagine not being able to get your fire wings out and spread out for miles. <laughs> you see an insect hell. They're like, yo, that flaming flying though. They're like, I died in our room. Hey, <laughs> what a bitch. <laughs> Damn, my bad. Needless to say, even though Ramsey was the one who said that he knew how to reroute the main power to the ADS, Malcolm is the one walking these two through it. It's absolutely amazing the lengths Colin is going through just to make crappy redos of scenes from earlier films. That's a lot of words. Too bad I'm not re- <laughs> Dude, I don't even know what the fuck's going on. I'm not gonna pretend I haven't been on my phone quite often arguing about fighting games, but like, this shit is dumb and boring. Yeah, and convoluted. Yeah. It really is. Which is really weird for a movie about nothing happening. Dude. <laughs> Do I need to be the one to ask why the hell is Ramsey not the one down in the power station doing this? Why did he send these two to do it before having Malcolm be the one that walks them through it? How does that plan make any kind of logistical sense to you people? Also, I'm not even going to bother building up to this. The, the locusts all come back to life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It turns out they weren't actually dead. Yes, the locusts that were on fire. You heard me correctly. How'd that happen? Uh, I don't know. The lights turned no, on. I'm do they sure. have, do they have not, crazy have, wolverine <laughs> like regen regenerative powers? Have you never seen a bug jump towards the light? They turn the lights on. The bugs are like, damn, lamp. Have you ever, have you ever seen a bug get lit on fire? No. And then wake back up? No, because I've never seen a bug even get lit on fire. So it is a good line if I said I have it. Remember when these were on fire? And yeah, now they're... Now not only do they no, stay they on they fire... Are more powerful than ever. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm not. Limited power! Limited power! <laughs> Remember when the stupidest thing in a movie we watched was this dumbass not just picking truth? Man, I miss those times. Things were simpler. Characters weren't invincible super soldiers pretending to be scared as they mow their way through the story. Imagine enjoying this movie. <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I, I can't. I, I, I want to die. <laughs> anyway, back on track. Now our heroes need to start hacking away at the locusts. But oh no. Turns out the ADS isn't actually on still. Ah, of course, naturally. You just break it. This usually has the desired effect. Hey, look at that! 
uh, uh, exponentially fortuitous for all parties. Wait, oh. wait, wait, wait. Did they just bash that thing to make it work? Yeah. yeah. It's like, <laughs> yes, yeah. they did. <laughs> yeah. That whole Something rigmarole like that. of like going through like all the button pressing and uh, shit was useless. Uh, nah, nah, it works better now. They fixed so it. You just, ha- my... you just have to <laughs> thwack it. If my PlayStation or Xbox starts acting up, should I grab a hammer and, and yep. take it to that bitch? Yeah, just yes. Whack. yes, yes, yes. Yeah, it makes perfect sense. <laughs> yeah, it uh, turns out that destroying the power supply actually reroutes your power to other stuff. You can keep that in mind next time you have a power outage. Just start smashing your TV or something. So how nice. All well that ends well. Okay, cutie. She's crashed every plane we've seen her in. Yeah, yeah. She's basically Joseph Josar at this point. <laughs> and we've discovered that Dr. Wu is on our side, completing our ensemble cast at nine goddamn characters. But that's okay, because we're basically done now. Our little group of idiots just needs to get on the helicopter with Kayla, and then we're home free. Like, we're actually almost done. The finish line is in sight, everyone. However, huh. How long has it been since we had a dinosaur fight? Did we have one in the last movie? Yeah? Oh, well, we need to have another. The movie's more or less over, though. That's gonna make it a little difficult. It's not like it wasn't Jurassic World where the fight with the Indominus had meaning to the story. I mean, it was still stupid and shoehorned in, but at least it technically had narrative meaning. We don't actually have any main dinosaurs that are still posing any kind of significant threat since, you know, they're leaving now. Well, damn, this is a problem. How are we going to stuff in a dinosaur fight and still have it be somewhat connected to this nonsensical chaos we're calling a story? Ah, well, screw it. (laughs) I'm not even going to warrant the ensuing chaos with any kind of logical breakdown. I have no earthly clue what's going on at this point. Colin just demanded there was a dinosaur fight, and it was so. But not before actually having the T-Rex walk through a circle so it could pose in the shape of the logo. Oh, now oh right no! <laughs> <laughs> now she can what? fly planes and helicopters. That's impressive. Yeah. Oh, Most look. Impressive. Oh, look at his shot. Look, look. Oh. <laughs> 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 oh, yeah. Fuck off. <laughs> it was a T Rex and it was in the circle, and then it roared when it was in the circle, so Jesus it was like a logo. Christ. <laughs> they just fucking did the logo. Wow. It's, it's incredible, isn't it? It's weird. Oh my god, it's oh the logo. Oh my god. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> they actually did that. They did. They very much did. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder. I wonder how many That's times the most Trevorrow insulting. Trevorrow yeah. his pants when he watched that back. <laughs> like this yeah. movie was clearly made to Just make fun of people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Where the hell is this spotlight coming from? This stupid light that's keeping the entire battle lit is actually coming from nowhere. Initially, one may assume it's Kayla until you realize that she's landed just prior to all of this happening, and the light is clearly coming from somewhere in the sky. So, no idea what's going on with that. There's one guy up in the tower. Hey, look at this, guys! They (laughs) shot the spotlight on him! Mike, you're losing him. Put the spotlight back on him. God. It's just someone has a camera, like, quick, get a wide shot of that. God damn it. Yeah. <laughs> Look, where's spotlight coming Also, every single other dinosaur completely disappears during this sequence. Not even 20 seconds prior, we had seen a sauropod wandering around along with a few other miscellaneous dinosaurs. On top of the fact that we're apparently being told that all of them are here currently. Because as we know, the implants were set to bring them all in away from the fire, meaning that every single dinosaur that's currently in this sanctuary is here currently, in this tiny-ass front lawn area. And yet not a single other dinosaur is to be seen as these two slap at each other. Well, at least until Edward Scissorhands shows back up for the finale. Not sure where he was during all this, but yeah, there you go. But there's this thing's here. It's just, it, it's just <laughs> randomly here. It just got <laughs> teleported in. Like, oh, I, I'm here now. This Let's so fight. <laughs> I mean, I think it's it, it's been well established that the dinosaurs just kind of spawn in That's next true. to characters. That is true. Which is why they don't make any noise beforehand. <laughs> Oh, look who else is here! Oh, look, it's the- it's the fucking deer it's assaulter. The dick bird! 
It's <laughs> 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 Big Bird. <laughs> Remember when Blue and the T Rex teamed up in Jurassic World 1 to beat the Indominus? Remember how stupid everyone agreed that was? Now, while well, we're doing it again, full on dinosaur team up to defeat what I, I guess has been the big bad of this movie. You better not fucking eat my bush, you bitch. I'll smack <laughs> you like I'll smack you like I did that fucking deer. Imagine, imagine they have the conversation. Oh, like, Stay away from my bush. It's like, bro, I don't even know where your fucking bush is. <laughs> like, yeah, could I, it be? I, I left like, it just to make sure. Shine the spotlight look. on his <gasps> eye right now. Could it be the T Rex has risen from the dead. Yeah. I couldn't really tell provided considering before this point he was present in a grand total of one scene. Like, come on, guys. God damn. The T-Rex was an ever-present threat in Jurassic Park and Lost World. The Spinosaurus was an ever-present threat in Jurassic Park 3. The Indominus was an ever-present threat in Jurassic World. Fallen Kingdom didn't really have anything, but... Then again, Fallen Kingdom just overall feels like a particularly nasty fever dream. Aside from the point, though, what exactly has the Giganotosaurus done to even remotely justify it being the big villain of this movie? Aside from its introduction shot and its brief dance in super cool dino scene number 12, this thing has appeared in one scene. And it didn't even do anything. And yet the movie wants us to treat it like it's this movie's Indominus. It hasn't even killed anything in this movie. It's been a scavenger. So what exactly is warranting this big of a payoff? Oh yeah, that part. That part that wasn't in the movie. That absolutely would have been a better opening than what we got. That's what we're building this payoff from. He is gonna get, get a little and juice now I have the DNA! <laughs> <laughs> What's that one? The scales didn't do very much for him, did it? God damn, Jurassic World. What is it with you in throwing all your important plot information into third-party promotional material? Why do I need to go on a real-life scavenger hunt to understand your movie, Colin? I suppose you could try and pass it off as interactive storytelling or some nonsense, but then again, sure is too bad that some of that interactive innovation is on a timer, huh? Ah, but don't worry, you may be saying. The upcoming extended cut is going to have it in there. Cool, so I have to wait for the movie's physical release if I want to receive all the necessary context. Let's see here, 14 minutes of additional footage, huh? Featuring more dinosaurs, action, iconic character moments, and an alternate opening. Right, so that changes everything. So it adds in the prologue, some more dinosaur set pieces, and more drawn out moments of the camera lingering on Sam, Jeff, and Laura while the theme music quietly plays in the background. Cool, I'm sure it'll completely fix the film just like every single other extended cut has done in the past. So while we wait for that, we can take solace that the out of movie explanation is that the T-Rex is mad that the Giganotosaurus killed it 65 million years ago. Fantastic. Ain't that the one from the flashback? Yeah. Oh my god. He fuck. remembers. <laughs> His dinosaur assassin's creed. Yeah. <laughs> I would have ironically rather watch that. <laughs> so I suppose we should be treating this as the epic coming of age showdown that it is, where the T-Rex and this random other dinosaur are taking revenge on this other hapless predator that's only following its instincts to survive. And this time, the dinosaurs are telepathically communicating with each other, which allows them to strategize how they're going to take this dummy down, basically by doing this. Good job, Colin. <laughs> oh, look, look, what yeah. oh. <laughs> oh, oh, my God. Yeah, yeah good one, Ooh, bud. I, I, I swear <laughs> I to God, think. the first time I watched this, I was like, these motherfuckers better high five. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now those two are going to fight. No, they will nod at each other with mutual respect and go <sighs> on their separate but, ways. But, but, but. <laughs> Man, I sure do hope all those nameless scientists and staff members got off safely and not burning alive right now. And our heroes fly away in triumph as the sanctuary burns down. Look at that. There are so many characters in this movie. They're all just stuffed in that helicopter. <laughs> like a goddamn clown car. <laughs> God damn it. 
and every single living creature there proceeds to die of smoke inhalation and or just generally being on fire, since, you know, everything's still on fire. Movie rather seems to not want us to think about that, though. Everything is happy and everything is good again. Don't think about logical outcomes. Every single dinosaur was perfectly fine. Well, except for the evil ones. They all died for being evil. And in the end, they did nothing but make Biosyn richer. We're going to make an oversight committee. <laughs> We're going to regulate and make sure that these big businesses are kept in check and are working for the benefit of our people. And there we go. Movie's done. Ride's over, folks. Please disengage your seatbelts and proceed to the marked exits. Oh, what's that? We still have character plot points to wrap up? Okay, yeah, well, whatever. Here's a, here's a scene for that. Alan and Ellie are together now, and they lived happily ever after. And Maisie is going back to live with Owen and Claire again. No, no one noticed that she's Lockwood's grandchild that went missing after the mansion incident. Shut up. Dr. Wu fixed the locust problem. Yeah, that, that, that thing he said he would do? Yeah, he did it. Everything's good now. Yeah, 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 you know, the, the entire driving force of the movie's plot. The side character resolved it off screen. It's fine now. Look, the locusts are swarming nicely. Everybody's happy. <laughs> oh, are they going to make a shape? Oh, no, knowing this movie. I wouldn't be surprised if they tried making the logo again. <laughs> <laughs> and then, let's see. And you're going to let this thing go. Everybody's <laughs> fucking stupid to the bitter goddamn end. Yeah, yeah they, they let Blue Jr. out and it reunited with Blue. And, and everybody was happy forever, whatever the hell. Oh, and Mother was just happy and waiting. Yeah, yeah. But it's been too long, and so now she takes it as a threat and she kills it. <laughs> Dope as fuck. Like, oh shit, nature be like that sometimes, nature you know? Nature be like that. The credits yeah. roll. I'd be like, you know what? 10 out of 10. <laughs> that was a good misdirect. I will go on to destroy the ecosystem uh, severely. As well as cause countless human casualties. Yeah, realistically, I'm going to die in two two weeks because my lungs are big because they're weak. And I need way more oxygen. Okay, now the movie's over. We're done. You can screw off now. Oh crap, there are still dinosaurs loose in the wild. God damn it, we completely forgot about that. That was the whole climatic setup from the last movie. Um, hold on, hold on. Not a single species went extinct from having several dozen highly invasive new species introduced into the wild. None. They all coexisted happily. And dinosaurs were only a part of that. And we're an even smaller Ow. part of that. <laughs> they really put... <laughs> <laughs> claw on a lobster clothes. <laughs> the ecological system definitely didn't immediately collapse and dinosaurs and humans lived together in harmony forever. The end. We don't coexist with this stuff. Nah, it'll be fine. We're fucked. Nah, it'll be fine. No, it's gonna eat that whale. <laughs> <laughs> Let, let's go against the laws of nature what and oh the look fuck? they're running what with the horses the fuck? Oh, look at how majestic that is look, look at all the, the, the they're integrating with <laughs> look at all of the catacodalists okay. they're integrating with nature isn't it beautiful oh my okay so so for I'll the like audience it. the audience at home that may see this part Catacodalists are literally the size of Oh wow, of giraffes. goodbye whales, goodbye whale population. No, 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 no. Yeah, the whale population. They're gonna get eat. fucking eaten. Yeah. Dude, I'd love to see like this like triumphant peaceful shit and then just see this thing <laughs> swallow an orca. Oh look, fucking elephants and... <laughs> <laughs> Is that how it ends? Jesus fucking Christ. Yeah, you, you, you created a disaster. Holy shit, you've doomed this, us all. This is... This, this this is this is terrible. Are you there? Over? Nope. Yes, <laughs> yes. It's over. Well, Fuck you, Colin Trevor. <laughs> what was this movie? This was so incredibly retarded. Isn't that great? <laughs> you have no. to no. disgrace no. to, like, to Michael Crichton. How uh, dare you <laughs> disgrace him like that? Spielberg, okay. fucked me too. Oh man. Is, was this supposed to be a trilogy? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh no. <laughs>
God damn, that was rough. That was really rough. Yeah, I'm going back to making fun of crappy horror movies. Jurassic Park is a franchise that is incredibly important to me, and one that has been for essentially most of my life. I have deeply personal memories attached to every single one. Yes, even World and Fallen Kingdom. There is something to be said about looking back at a movie and the events of one's life when they first experienced it. These memories can be solemn or they can be happy, but in the best of cases, they're enlightening. A look into what could have been, a chance to improve oneself, or even just a moment to reminisce of times long past. We are, by our very nature, self-reflecting creatures, and it's easy for us to attach ourselves to something as simple as the first time we saw a movie. Our memories are powerful drivers to our emotions, more so than a lot of people give credit for. And these are the things that Hollywood takes advantage of when trying to sell you a new reboot or sequel. Turning your own memory into their profit through shallow manipulation tactics and reminders of those times past. Do you remember the good old days? Weren't things so much better back then? Jurassic World Dominion doesn't just have a bad story. It barely even has a story. It is a movie that has had its narrative put in as an afterthought. Elements of this story were crafted around the action scenes and the fan service moments, rather than it being the other way around. Throughout the film, we regularly jumped from one location and one tone after another, to the point where nothing was connected and every scene felt like its own individual film. Now, this isn't the first movie to do this, and it certainly isn't even the worst offender, but it's a thing that I and a few of my friends have been noticing for quite a while now. And this is a problem that isn't just restricted to the story. Throughout the movie, and in others as well, we've seen a lot more in terms of strange editing choices. In that when you're watching a certain scene play out, you can suddenly tell that something was just... cut out. And these usually aren't insignificant things, either. Establishing shots, seeing a character move from point A to point B, and even just certain interactions with the environment will strangely be absent from scenes where you'd regularly expect them to be. Almost as if the filmmakers purposefully cut them so that they could make room for... other things. The point I'm getting at here is that this isn't going to improve. These movies are not going to be getting better, and I'm not really one to be the bearer of bad news, but this is an important thing to recognize. As original content is becoming less and less profitable with each passing year, and reboots and remakes are rapidly enveloping the entire market, the quality has not just declined, it's plummeted. And I don't think there's a better example of that than this movie. Filmmakers and Hollywood executives are not only realizing they can get away with not trying, they've realized that they can make fun of you to your face and still expect your support of their products. And that is what Jurassic World Dominion was. A film that was made because the people behind it think that you will eat up whatever they dish out because they threw in some old people you used to like. There is pushback, yes. People like myself that say no to this kind of insulting media. But even then, some of us are misguided or inconsistent in our approaches. We're all guilty of it, some more than others. And in the end, those of us that aren't complete monkeys about it are at least sharing in the desire of trying to figure out the proper way to break this crap down. Sometimes it doesn't go well, obviously. Sometimes people become pretentious and stuck up in their conclusions. Sometimes people deconstruct their once high standards for a much lower one through means of demoralization. And sometimes people go full on nothing matters and just approach every film with the general how did it make me feel critique. But it's not like this is affecting the movies we're getting in literally any fashion whatsoever. They don't care. Obviously they don't care. And what's more, they've already proven time and time again that they don't care what we say, regardless of how many of us there are. Yes, they'll tweak crap so they can condescendingly pat us on the head and go, There, there, buddy, we made Luke Skywalker better again. But this isn't the first time the film market has thrown out bottom-tier garbage like this and proceeded to not give a single solitary crap about it. And while this certainly isn't going to be a speedy process, I don't think that it's far-fetched to say that we're going to be getting more movies like this. More movies where the story is just an extra thing for people who want one, while everything else is just mindless action doubled with increasingly manipulative tactics for taking advantage of your past. And in a world where Hollywood has access to ever-improving CGI that can raise any actor or character from the dead, 
the possibilities are quite literally endless. And as time goes on, the effort is going to become less needed, and filmmakers will know this. These stories are going to become worse and worse, becoming more dependent on dialogue and exposition that people are eventually going to start complaining about. Why are you wasting time in this monster movie with this boring-ass story, after all? And as these stories become the least popular part of these movies, will they be taken out altogether? Leaving us with nothing but action scenes and nostalgia baiting? The film industry bastardized, where the only reason to watch a film would be for the dopamine hits of a fast-paced action scene, or a character that you know and love saying something funny. Is that a bit of an extreme outcome, and am I being slightly hyperbolic? Eh, yeah, kind of. But make no mistake, if movies like this are allowed to just fester and the general public just accepts them as at-worst middle-of-the-road movies, which... Eh... Then yeah. Maybe I'm even underselling this a little bit. Because in the end, this video wasn't just a review of Jurassic World Dominion. This is a review of the people that still, to this day, continue to gobble up the slop that the film industry regurgitates into our faces while humbly asking for more of it. And this goes both ways. Whether you're going onto social media to praise it or pan it, you're just another checked box to these companies. If you're one of those people that say, oh, I just like turning my brain off when I watch a movie, then cool, man. They like it when you do that too. Because this isn't about telling a good story anymore. And it hasn't been for a very, very long time now. A lot of you are just now starting to see it. And if you're someone like myself who meticulously criticizes it, don't be blind by telling yourself that your words are instigating any kind of shift. I am one of the many other people in the content sphere that's providing this much-needed pushback against this idiocy. Make no mistake, I am under no delusion that I am going to have any kind of effect on the film industry whatsoever. Nobody there cares what I have to say. No amount of backlash or criticism has improved these movies in any fashion whatsoever, and in fact, they've only gotten worse. You'd be a fool to deny that, and equally so to assume this downward trend isn't going to continue. However, I do hope that I can have some kind of effect on a much smaller scale, and that is why this is so incredibly important. It isn't for any blind or deluded hope that Hollywood will see it and put forth more effort, because that obviously isn't going to happen, for more than one reason. More so, it's for making sure that people don't become demoralized to it, and realize that the standards you hold these movies up to are more important than you can possibly imagine. Never lower your standards, and never accept something for its label, dear viewer. Stop supporting the slime these assholes keep pelting at us, because there are still good stories out there. Provided few and far between, depending on how recently we're talking, but the point remains. There are always exceptions to the rule, and filmmakers that actually deserve your support and attention. Even as they're being drowned out by the screams of mainstream mediocrity. I'm not an ultra-big YouTuber. I'm a pretty damn small one. And these videos I make aren't exactly new viewer friendly. So I'm not expecting to reach a lot of people here. But if you're one of the very few people who will ever reach the end of this video, I hope that I can leave you with that alone. Maintain your standards. Don't accept the schlock. Because saying no to this kind of crap is important, and don't ever think that it isn't. For everybody who loves the craft of storytelling and the magical things we can dream up from it, it is an art that we cannot allow ourselves to lose, and we must always ensure that we nurture it, regardless of what the conveyor belt presents to us. Jurassic World Dominion. Multiverse of Madness. Lightyear, Morbius, Rings of Power, these pieces of media are going to keep coming, and they're going to keep getting worse. But I hope we don't just accept that in the end. I hope we stop supporting these people that have shown us time and time again that they don't have anything left to give us. I'd like to think that we'll hold on to our standards and say no to this crap. Because I will. Whether I'm the only one doing it or not, I'm going to keep pushing against this conveyor belt in any way I can. Because for every seven MCU films we get, we also get an Archive 81 hidden somewhere in the dark. Thank you everyone for tuning in. Stay well.